This piece of content is brought to you by the Minis Forum HX77G, a fantastic little Windows gaming console that comes with a 6600M, a 7735 HS, and honestly impressed me with its performance. Click the link in the description and make sure they know I sent you to support the channel and support yourself by getting this cool product, but also support the channel by using Broken Sailcon to get discounts on Windows keys at cdkeyalpha.com and on Vite Ramen at the links below. And we'll talk more about those sponsors later, but for now, let's just get on with the show. And welcome to Broken Silicon, a gaming hardware podcast. I am your host, Tom. And today I'm having somebody on that actually, I mean, I'm sure I saw you before, but I remember most notably seeing you in a comment section for a Broken Silicon episode with a a digital audio workstation engineer. Um, So that immediately pegged me and then I looked at some of your content. I was like, yeah, remember... This person here that, that who clearly follows a lot of similar stuff, we'll have to talk to him eventually. And here you are. But please introduce yourself, tell people who you are, what you do, and uh, what got you into this line of work. The usual questions, the good questions. I'm Leo Waldock. I'm from the UK. I'm a freelancer, but I've been freelancing for Kit Guru for nine, I think, years. So it feels like a job, even though it's technically not. Uh, so that's kitguru.net on the web, kitguru tech on YouTube. I used to have regular jobs, happened to get into reviewing hardware, PC hardware by chance, talked to a person who sent me, I think my first review is a mouse. That was 25 years ago. Uh, talked to somebody else who said, I've just started editing a magazine. I need staff and so on and so on. Just for one step to the next, uh, started helping out kitguru with written reviews. Uh, eight to nine years ago now they didn't do video at the time purely web um happened to do a video clip to describe a bluetooth speaker because talking about audio is a nightmare and they Mm. said you do video i said you've literally got all my videos in the world and they said we should do videos like okay uh we got past the thought which was youtube was never going to be a thing um (laughs) and (laughs) <laughs> and it's kept on rolling and the the door engineer you're talking to was he a new zealand or an australian from memory uh, was talking about oh Saf- yes he was uh, australian the, digital digital audio workstation uh was talking about sapphire rapids and i just reviewed sapphire rapids for kit guru now we are pc gaming uh crossover with moore's law is dead and gamers nexus and other channels is significant um for some reason intel sent me uh, a review kit for Technically, it's Sapphire Rapids workstation, so it was build your own system. So it's two processors, a motherboard, a Noctua mm-hmm. cooler. Um, and they apparently sent 10 of these kits to Europe. Why they sent one to me is a mystery. I'm not a workstation guy at all. And I watched your uh, podcast with that, or that interview with that guy, and the points he was describing were precisely in line with mine. And I thought, well, as I'm one of a handful of people in Europe to actually work with this stuff, I was responding to some very specific points because generally it feels like I'm uh, raining other people's parades if I start commenting on their work. I wouldn't massively like it if people did it to me unless it's on point. Um, And in this case, the guy was talking specifically about it was four-channel, eight-channel memory support on Sapphire Rapids, and people are commenting below my video to say, why did you only do four-channel? Because the motherboard only did four-channel, had eight slots, four-channel. And the other motherboard that was doing the rounds, I had an ASRock, was uh, an Azus Sage WS, monumentally expensive. And that had eight memory slots, and it had one of those bias notes saying, we will support eight-channel DIMMs when we do an update. Mm. Put it another way, it doesn't at the moment. And that's the kind of thing you only even get to hear about when you actually got your hands on the hardware, because what you see in the headline is, Azus does eight-channel, ASRock does four-channel. So, uh, and then the other thing your guy was talking about was power supply shutting down. And I'd had precisely uh, when you had um, the ATX3 uh, overload thing going on, transients. And I'd had precisely that on my own PC. 
uh, happened very recently. And I had to do some power supply swapping. Um, uh, so I thought, well, this is my brother from the other side of the world. He mm -hmm. and I, we've suffered together. Plus, he had some really good, deep details, which I hadn't heard on Sapphire Rapid, sadly, after I'd done my review. But happily, it just verified what I found myself. So I thought, I'll comment. And you responded, and one of your readers responded. And that was three months ago, I think. And yeah, that was already. it. And then you reached out quite recently. So there you go. That's a 10 minute answer to a two minute question. Well, so it's interesting too. Um, someone else that I met here where I live in Nashville, he is part of a band, very Nashville, called Vice Tone. And, you know, they do a lot of stuff with electronics. And so he does a lot of the mixing and kind of like, I know he's in charge of like, or I don't know if he's in charge. He likes doing it too, right? He builds workstations for his band for, mm. and a lot of it's used for audio. And he also, after that episode came out, texted me and said, by the way, I have one of these Sapphire workstations, Sapphire Rapids workstations. It's 36 co cores. It's really great, but I need like an 1800 watt power supply. Mm. And in fact, I have a custom liquid cooling loop and the most craziest one I've ever built. And we put it in its own room next to the studio with a hole for the wires for the keyboard and monitor to come through because it gets so hot. It was messing with our ability to really even work in the recording studio. <laughs> He's like, it's really fast though, but you know, and, I, and it's interesting because people I've talked to, you know, you, the DAW engineer, the, the guy from Vice Tone, like we have a situation where, it go if it was a gradient, it's it goes from the Dodge engineer, I would say, who says this thing's unusable. Then there's you in the middle that said there's a lot of issues, but it's fast. And then there's oh. this guy who's like, I like it, but man, did I have to try hard to make it work well. It doesn't seem like anyone I've talked to has said this thing has been firing off without a hitch. It seems to be a launch of a product with tons of caveats around it if you want it and, and a lot of people well actually i'll ask the question now qh freddy says very few mainstream reviewers ended up testing intel sapphire rapid z on w parts in part due to nobody sampling them how did you end up getting it i guess you answered that and do you think they were worth covering as a reviewer and i just want to touch in here my personal opinion is intel did not send these out to a lot of people precisely because unless someone was going to tinker a lot and i guess if i'm being honest like they were one of the few people they got it, so they're going to try extra hard. I just can't imagine if this went to hardware and boxing gamers Nexus, they were going to say nice things. So that's <laughs> why Intel didn't send them. So I am now officially, therefore, the nice guy compared to uh, Steve and Tim and Steve. That, well, well, let me give you an example, though. A damning let's indictment. Say, let's say there was an RTX 4095, and it was $5,000, mm. and it was sampled mm. to nobody, and for some reason it didn't use like 400 watts it used like a thousand <laughs> and mm, then sure. they sent one to me but they didn't send one to anybody else mm. i'm telling you i'm just being honest with people watching this i would try extra hard to get it working because i know i'm one of the only people to get it i'm not saying it's like a oh, it's cool. not a conflict yeah, yeah, of yeah. interest it's oh well i'm one of the only people who has this i can't wait to tinker with it and i think maybe there's something going on there where they want to only send it to people who are known to tinker a lot. And, and so that's why they send it to a few people, maybe. Although it does seem random. You didn't expect to get it. No, I've, I, okay, I've got three kind of levels of an answer to that. So the first thing is, yes, if you know for a fact there's only so many people have got the thing, then yes, of course, you're going to put in the, in the, in the work to make it work. By contrast, I have the three... Uh, alleged 14th gen Raptor Lake refresh processors, the i5, i7, i9, I have not reviewed them. And that's the first review I've <laughs> missed in a thousand years because we all knew precisely what it would be in advance. Therefore, you know how the, the, the community is going to receive it. You know the odds of finding an angle that's not been touched mm. and, and blah, blah, blah. And therefore, you know I, I knew two months in advance, as you did, as did everybody, which is the only way of getting any traction with it was basically just to monster it, you know, to, to literally, I don't know, put it on a rifle range and shoot it and go, <laughs> that's what I think of this thing. It's just, you know, or whatever it might be. It's that kind of just hyperbole to the nth degree. Um, Sapphire Rapids, I did not expect to receive it, but I, I've made a point over the past, oh, I don't know, two years, three years, of doing videos on uh, Intel processes, the five nodes, four years, and things like that. Um, partly to have a body of work so we can just refer to it, 
rather than having to take everything as being a new thing. Mm. Uh, and also as a way around the embargoes on reviews. So when they're going to do Raptor Lake, if you first tackled certain issues which are public domain, you can then just fill in the blanks with the process review. You don't have to start the review with the 10 minutes of background. And I think my Intel rep was aware, therefore, when it came to Sapphire Rapids, I actually had some background knowledge to it, which mm. various other uh, pick a channel that just does PC builds with a, an AIO cooler and a desktop processor. And here we go. And we've got some braided cables. He knows full well my knowledge is slightly deeper than that. And, and um, I haven't moved sideways. I'm just trying to make my life more rounded in this area. The, the Sapphire Rapids review, the, I think oh, that's the third point, was so I was aware that 10 reviewers across Europe had them, and mm. uh, I'd run into problems gaining memory in the first case so, because it's DDR5, um, registered DDR5 on that, and I think ECC at that. Uh, so I reached out to G Skill, who uh, Kitger and a great many other reviewers have a very, you, you'll see G Skill memory used a lot, even though it's a relatively niche brand because they are really good people and they know their stuff. And if reviewers reach out and they're legit reviewers, they'll typically get support from G-School. In this one instance, my message back was, the set I have that will work with Sapphire Rapids is not available because it's gone to dot, dot, dot. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, okay. It turned out dot, dot, dot was waiting for my processors when I had finished with them. Oh. But that's a separate. It was, like, it was literally at that level of, in other words, you knew which name had which processors. Um, you're almost tempting to put a note in the box before it went back to say, by the way, here you go. And I, I watched out when my, when the reviews went live and the embargo lifted, and mine was the only review. No other mm -hmm. reviews went live. And whether it's because other people had trouble, and I, relatively speaking, did not, I don't know. I had to reach out. I said as much in my video to um, Martin, who writes uh, the HW Info software, because the software was all over the place with Sapphire Rapids. And he said, do me a dump because I can't get my hands on these things. No problem. Here you go. You're a great guy. His software is brilliant. HW Info 64. But his data dump came from me so he could make his software function with Sapphire Rapids and tell me what the heck it was doing because it was just lying at first. Mm -hmm. So there, there was a bit of a virtuous circle going on. But still, that refused. To, I, I can't remember what the. It's done 30K or 50K views on YouTube, which is nothing special for a unique product. That is low for a unique product. I've not yet seen another review of it. Oh, Debauer, of course, mm -hmm. did his Debauer thing. But uh, yeah, so 10 sets of processors and eight of them, don't know. Yeah, I mean, I have to say too, and I think this came up in that DA engineer. Uh, uh, interview is if i was one of the only people to get this and you know if i'm being honest it's because you know at my channel i have to like this is a channel that goes through a lot of opinions like i'm very oh. unabashed in what i think about things and that invites whether it's fair or not it's just but it's the truth it invites a lot of criticism because i'm giving so many opinions so people are going to have strong opinions on my opinions and a lot of them are around intel if i were to receive these processors i'm just being honest with everyone i would be scared to give it a bad review because i think they would go well of course he hates it and, and i and i would be scared to do that as a little bit though as anybody because intel hasn't really had hedt or workstation processors and they haven't de facto had any for years and so you know, I know people think I'm critical of Intel. I would want so bad to give this a good review <laughs> because I want there to be more competition in this segment that has seen Intel just lose and leave and then AMD go, oh, you're leaving. Well, then I guess we're leaving too. Who cares? Whatever. Like, no one's going to bother. And I mean, I'm wondering how much you went back and forth with it too. Like, is there a chance this is a bad sample or is, you know... It like I guess this is it. This is what it is. I wonder like how much you thought about that too before well, posting it. The, the thing is, so when I was um, when I when I was not reviewing the i nine fourteen nine hundred K, I was a, I was working on a, a case at the time. It was uh, the weekend before the, and I was getting messages from um, uh, another reviewer who was working on their launch review, and they were saying, "My God, have you seen the power draw of this thing?" I said, "Literally, I've not even put it in a motherboard yet." Because my God, you have, you have no time. I said, I'm not doing it. Um, I'm just, he goes, in, in what way are you not doing it? I said, I'm not doing it. Uh, I'll get to it, but I'm not doing it. He goes, I've got this power draw and that power draw. I said, sure, I believe that. 
And he goes, can you verify? I said, I've literally not put the processor in the motherboard. So no, I can't say. Um, but sure, uh, your figures sound right to me. And he was saying, this is absolutely crazy. I said, well, uh, the, the, what it was doing. And I said, well, there you go. Uh, what do you expect? <laughs> Have a nice weekend. Uh, whereas with Sapphire Rapids, um, it was this thing of 500 watts under load. I mean, Cinebench load, not like an AVX 512 kind of load. Yeah. It was just like, what? And also the clock speeds, uh, what I I'm going from memory, 2.9 gigahertz, 3.3 gigahertz. You know, in other words, not like four or five. If you mm. go back to that um, that ringer they pulled on us with the 28-core Z on a legend yeah. desktop, Computex four or five years ago, it can do five gigahertz, and they've got the 1,000-watt chiller on the go and all that nonsense. This wasn't that. Th this was... The strangest thing, because it's running on a desktop power supply once I'd figured out what it needed with the memory and blah, blah, blah. It was all good, but it had a Noctua air cooler on it. And the mm. thing it brought home to me was the thing about thermal density, because the processor is enormous. It is the same size as a Threadripper to within nothing. And as you know, a Threadripper is enormous. Most people haven't played with Threadrippers. Mm -hmm. I'm holding up my finger. It's about yay size. It's just monumental. And it brought home that you can put a huge amount of power through a large area and the density is not that bad. Mm -hmm. And, but clearly when you move onto a workstation, as your, your guy from the band was saying, you've got to cool the damn thing mm -hmm. and therefore noise or, or a huge cooler or something. And that's problematic. And the thought that occurred to me about the review was because I take your point about you don't really want to receive something approaching a favor and then just throw it back in their face. On the other hand, you've got a job to do, is I suspect the vast majority of these processors have gone into the Aurora, it's the Aurora supercomputer that uses Sapphire Rapids and Pontevecchia. I believe I so. I mean, there is an Intel and, and the that they're talking about a lot. Right, and the numbers are something monumental, like I can't remember, 25,000 Sapphire Rapids and then four Pontevecchias per Sapphire Rapids. So there are huge, huge numbers, and they only start... They were late, get, I mean, very late getting it because they had completely overhauled it. So really, to me, the customer for all these processors is one of the, uh, uh, I think is the Argonne National Laboratory, one of your national laboratories over there anyway. Mm -hmm. um, we're probably so grateful to receive the thing and have it working. It's like, yeah, yeah, we, we can handle however many megawatts of cooling that is. And then they've got the other fun and games, which is uh, Emerald Rapids is due in the nearish future. Yeah, but December 14th, a 2023 launch, apparently. <laughs> there we go. But my understanding is that the uh, the Aurora supercomputer is due to be updated not with Emerald Rapids, but with the HBM version of Sapphire Rapids, mm. for whatever reason. Um, presuming it suits there. So that's going to be 20, 25,000 of the HBM version of Sapphire Rapids going to uh, I mean, when you know, it's not a computer. Obviously, it's it's an installation, uh, and it then means that twenty five thousand or so regular Sapphire Rapids, I guess, are going to suddenly appear on the used market. That's a good God, point. Actually, gonna... <laughs> it's it's just, it's such an enormous number. Uh, uh, when you see these guys installing four Pontevecchios per thing, and then racks of things, and suddenly you've got an image a bit like the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark. You know, an enormous warehouse, and it's like, well, what do they do with them all? Um, so, in a sense, my review of the thing, I think, was nothing. <laughs> <laughs> you reminded me of a bygone era, too, before AMD entered the arena and really started competing again, where it, it look, it kind of sucked, it did suck, that there wasn't a lot of competition in CPU. But at the same time, um, I'd say really between like 2014 through 2016, there was this interesting period where... Oh. Every server company, every big company was just switching every three years to the new Xeon, and then they would just dump them on eBay. And my friend, and, and, and that included a lot of engineering samples that you could overclock uh, or get for even cheaper prices. And like, I remember I, I, I built my PC like a month too soon. I had a Skylake quad core i7, which is fine. You know, it worked fine. But then a month later, you know, I paid like $300 or something for that i7. On eBay, oh. I noticed a Broadwell 10-core 
with 20 it's, thread for $250. And I'm like, you've got to get this. This is a 10 core. And he used that from 2016 until like a year ago because he had 20 threads. Of course, he disabled mm-hmm. hyperthreading once all the exploits came out, but he still had 10 full cores. And there was this period where like these Xeons and engineering samples would be dumped. And if you knew what to look for, you could just get... I mean, yes, it sucked that quad cores were $300, but you could also sometimes find these like 10 cores from the previous gen for $200, which was an interesting choice. And that's when the um, Intel, when Intel introduced the concept of high end desktop clearly as a way of scalping the enthusiasts. So instead of getting a quad core, you could have a six core, and then they edged up to eight and 10. Uh, in, a, in a way, AMD saved Intel from a nasty problem, I feel, which is. Mm-hmm. How do you get down off the high wire? Well, if AMD comes along and just takes your entire damn market away from you, you haven't got the problem. You just, maybe you can start it again, maybe you can't. Um, and we shall see about that. But uh, yeah, the high end desktop from Intel. And then, as you say, eBay Xeons, by God, there were some bargains. I mean, I, I was high end desktop X99, then X299 myself for, oh, some, a few years. Mm-hmm. And then I went Threadripper. I always, I went previous generation because it was uh, discounted like crazy. I'd have motherboards and memory, you know, a- around me. But the processor I bought, because the last thing I want is someone saying, I want the processor back three years later. It's always possible. Um, so, no, no, I bought it. It's mine. No. Nah. Um, it's in my workstation and it works because much the same as your friend. You can get some absolute bargains. Thank you, eBay. Um, yeah. And I've but not really anymore moment. because uh no. i mean no, no one wants a 10 Zen core you know when you can Precisely. get a new zen or something it's we're innovating again so these deals aren't really deals anymore especially because the motherboard oh, costs no, far too much to just well, when yeah. i like a quiet work pc i like it a lot so i'm mm-hmm. happy having a zen 3 running at uh, with liquid cooling 65 celsius um i'm in the uk so the temperatures don't tend to get too bad here uh as opposed to Zen 4, which would certainly be a lot faster, but hotter and therefore noisier. And trade-off, just a trade-off. But yes, I agree. The bargains on eBay went, so I bought Zen 3. Yeah, it's an interesting question, too, of like when you were describing, I was thinking this, we were talking, too, like about Sapphire Rapids workstation, like how much power it used. It's like it becomes a real question, I think, right, of, you, you know, the point of workstation is it's not server, it's server overclocked because time is money more so than power mm. consumption is money. And I get that idea. But if it's making your room have 1500 watts of heat or something at a certain point, I mean, what, 16 cores Zen four or even like, like you're talking about using like a thousand watts less energy with your PC while you work, unless you really mean time is money and you're not one of those people that pretends they need it in four rooms. like. It's almost worth it to do your work a little slower, I would argue, at a certain point, if it means we're not talking about 100 watts less heat. We're talking about 1,000 to just go with a, a desktop platform at that point. Like, and, and that's why I think, I think um, possibly Zen 4 Threadripper entering into the arena is going to make a tremendous change. But you know, I actually do want to round back to a question here because we've been starting to dance around this subject. It's a question that I like to ask all of my guests the first time they're on because I see this as a real milestone like i think there was before and after core 2 you know i think there was you could even argue a milestone was just generally speaking like the stagnation of the consoles and then stagnation of 28 nanometer gpus got super cheap steam took off that's like the pc gaming renaissance area but i think another one is the launch of zen and i'm curious what you thought about zen a few years before it came out and then a few months, because I think there's a big difference. There's the early rumors where you're like, yeah, whatever, maybe it will be that good. And then there's <laughs> AMD actually as a PowerPoint. You know, like what were you expecting long before and then right before it came out? So the, the, my simple answer when Zen came along was I was grateful. I was grateful that AMD had come along and brought something new and it didn't suck. Uh, and, it, and it was eight actual cores and that was revolution. Even though I think with hindsight, when you look back a, a year or two later, you think, yeah, had Intel been on track, mm. they could have crushed it. They could have snuffed it out because the original Zen wasn't that great. They um, were supposed to have eight cores of Ice Lake yeah. on desktop in 2018. Yeah. Uh, if they had that to compete with Zen Plus, I think AMD would have been okay, yeah. but Intel yeah. wouldn't have been threatened. 
No, 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 ab- absolutely. Um, and you're in that coulda, shoulda, woulda kind of, uh, yes, but they didn't and therefore. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it also helped us that AMD was obviously desperate to make a success of it. On the other hand, when you look at the first go round with Ryzen, uh, you can see that the motherboard manufacturers didn't expect much from it. So all the motherboards were really not that great. Mm-hmm. Um, and memory speeds sucked and so on and so on and so on and for me the thing that really got me because at the time uh it was someone else from git guru that reviewed amd i did intel we, we just had separation it was just so we could keep our data sets going because we, we all work independently we're not in the same locations the various faces at kit guru and it when ryzen came along i bought one i bought a motherboard and i bought a processor for my own uh, purposes and i got into custom loop um because it, it was just better for case reviews i tended to do a lot of case reviews as well and people would put aio and it's great i'll put a, i'll put a custom loop in just because it's a different review so i liquid cooled my ryzen and the, and it was terrible and the reason it was terrible was because and you'll correct me i hope amd had offset the temperature reading by something like 10 or 20 celsius so you're looking mm, at your process. That sounds familiar. It's a long time ago, but that sounds like something right. I remember people talking about. But, but the processor was reporting like 95 Celsius, and on custom loop, that should just never happen when you've got an ambient of 20 or 25. That's just not a thing. That means everything's broken and broken badly. It's like, oh, Jesus, shut it down and find the problem. And the thing was, the reviewer's guide made no reference to this, because I, I got a copy. Of, so I hadn't been in the briefings, but I was talking to other reviewers. I got a copy of all the docs. It made no mention of this. When I called AMD, he said, I think I've got a real problem with the part I've bought. Um, I'm not bitching about the review. I'm not doing the mm-hmm. review, but I've got a real problem. And they said, oh, yeah, yeah, we've offset the temperature. I said, why on earth? Would, why would you make the temperature be reported higher than it truly is by tens of degrees Celsius? I don't know. It's just something someone thought was a good idea. It's like, <laughs> you're mad. But to, Do you um, think that to, there was it was just like some side effect of some bug or something, and they're like whatever? Or do you think it was they thought? And this is a thing that's true, like especially with like for example, Nvidia Lovelace. The cooler you make it, well, I mean, the less voltage it needs. And I think there's a real mm-hmm. balance in how much power consumption your fans are using turning on, and how mm-hmm. much power consumption the actual silicon itself is consuming. Because some people will <laughs> prank up their fans and say, "Look how low my temperature is," and it's like, "Well, yeah, but now your fans are using 30 more watts." Do you think maybe they thought Zen was just extra efficient if it was kept below a certain temperature, and they I, wanted I the fans to try harder? Any explanation I've ever been given by any manufacturer has never been true of almost anything. Okay. Bro- I mean, broadly, just just you can come up with a point and, and you'll get some response. And very often, the, res- the reason you're getting a response like um, that's just inaccurate or, or mis- misleading but in the nicest possible sense is because the guy you're talking to very often doesn't know himself. Oh, yeah. They've got a message and it's been passed down. What they know is they have a message to deliver. This is the message to deliver. RTX 4060 is brilliant. Yeah. But it's not, is it? No, it's brilliant. Oh, it's the and, and best eight of, gigabyte gaming card for the mainstream. Right, it's got right, effective right. bandwidth accelerated by L2 cache. Come on. Right, that is what right. they would say. So, <laughs> the, the thing is that if someone sold a processor and that processor is running at, let's say, for argument's sake, under load 75 Celsius with decent cooling, pick a number out of the air, and you report it as running at 55, then you're going to run into litigation issues from somebody you're bound to. There's no downside legally to reporting that this 75 degrees celsius process is actually running at 90 degrees that's not mm-hmm. going to cause them any problems it just drives guys like me wild because why would you do such a stupid thing um so whether they've done it to tweak some sort of offset in a bias because i mean at that time i didn't even know that um the agisa bias code was a thing i don't really heard the term at that point mm-hmm. amd rolls out a later version of agisa and then that goes into the i'm probably mispronouncing that and then that gets uh, put into the into the base of the BIOS code. So Gigabyte, MSI, Azus, ASRock just base their BIOS on that. Um, and they don't mess with the AMD code. So AMD may have just felt, oh, God, we need to offset something somewhere, change this and therefore thing. Didn't some guys, I think it's a conversation you had with one of your people, maybe someone else, some Intel engineer who was saying, oh, no, he's talking to Gamers Nexus. Um, we can put the 
uh, the temperature sensors anywhere we like in the process, and we can make mm. it say whatever we want. And of course, he's correct. Whether it's measuring the hottest point mm-hmm. or some point just somewhere under the heat spreader, it's just a number. They know what it means. We don't know what it means. And, mm-hmm. and that's just the thing. So, but I, I would say that, uh, the, so that's my, my view of the original Zen. Um, however, if you go back to AMD's processor called, I think, FX51 for memory, the first true two core processor, that was the oh god moment. I've had two oh god moments with, uh, or three. One was when AMD brought out a proper dual core processor. The other was my first experience with an SSD, which would have been some Intel SSD, mm-hmm. which would have been 80 gigabytes and probably cost a fortune. Maybe if, I think they first did a 40 gigabyte. It was like, huh, this is different. And then first time putting a custom block, liquid block on uh, a graphics card. Mm-hmm. And suddenly you, you lose all that huge cooler and the power is just dissipated. And it's, it, it's just like, huh, don't bother liquid cooling your processor, liquid cool your graphics card, except do you want to tear the cooler off a thousand pound graphics card? But um, the FX51 was the AMD rev- revelation for me. Mm-hmm. So when Ryzen came along, it was, it was relief. It was thank you, AMD, for doing something. And AM- Intel has to respond to this in time. Um, they have no choice. And, and their response? Did. Four years <laughs> well, of Skylake. Coffee Lake. <laughs> yeah. Coffee Lake. Um, but, but, but we had interesting times because... My interest at the time in uh, process technology was little. Mm-hmm. So we'd hear about Intel 10 nanometer, and it's like, whatever. Um, so the fact they haven't made a thing, they can't make a thing work, okay. Because we now know if we plug back in current knowledge back into what we knew then, uh, plus a lot of stuff we still don't know, had they done their disaggregated design and all the rest of it such that design was separate from process, mm-hmm. okay, we can't make it on the process we want because of something that doesn't function. There are all sorts of rumors about why 10 nanometer never worked. Isolate was clearly a catastrophe. Um, so we'll put the design in a different process or we'll ask TSMC to make it. Now, <laughs> or we'll actually said to fund me, our foundries enough. It's, the people I talk to at Intel, you know, like if you go back 10 years, the people at Intel publicly are like, well, you know, it's really hard to get to the latest nodes and we suspect TSMC will have trouble too. But if I talk to people, which I do all the time, right, of course, for my channel, oh. behind the scenes at Intel, they'll say, it just costs more. We needed more people and more money. And then they oh, bought the fee for the seven billions and they were wasting it. And then w- the second they started funding them, boom, 10 nanometer worked. It was just like they just needed it's to funny, spend more it? money. Give, give the money to engineers rather than and rather than letting accountants run the show. It's, it's miraculous how it can change things. But had you said to me back when 10 nanometer didn't work that in the future Intel would be getting their, um, well, call them CPUs, but as we now know, they're parts of CPUs from TSMC, we're like, mm-hmm. no sense at all. And yet, here we are. Yeah. Yeah, I mean... In some ways, it's such an interesting era with Zen till now, because on the one hand, it would have been fascinating to see what happens with like Zen 2 versus 8-core Ice Lake. I think that would have actually been an interesting comparison. On the other hand, I think in some ways, it's allowed AMD to become enough of a competitor where we don't have to worry that much about competition, at least in CPU, for the next five years. There will be competition. Maybe one of them will win or the other one will win, but... They're going to be competing with each other because they were had enough time to build up to become a real competitor. Well, it's that time of year again. The time of costumes, family, friends, and of course, also eating lots of unhealthy candy and food. It's also simultaneously usually when most people are crunching to finish up the work they need to for the year before the holidays. And while you're crunching, that usually means you're also likely to eat other unhealthy foods in between those bouts of eating unhealthy food with family and friends. Well, that's of course unless you eat Vite Ramen. This piece of content is sponsored by Vite Ramen. 
Fight Ramen is a healthy, tasty, and shelf-stable food crafted by an American startup that offers tons of options for eating healthy, like their classic packages that make it easy to add protein and other ingredients of your choice, including new flavors like Radiant Crab Roux, and also their Ramen Go packages that offer a healthy microwavable option for those who truly only have a 15-minute lunch break that's sometimes away from home. Or they also have other healthy products like their Nano Boost Powder that makes any food at least a little healthy. Click on the link in the description and use the offer code BROKENSILICON to get 10% off a variety of products from Bite Ramen, like special bundles for Moore's Law's Dead fans, raw nudes if you want to make up your own recipes with their noodles, and other food products, powders, and utensils and more. They really are a plucky small startup that has been really good to Moore's Law is Dead for years now, and I also genuinely like their product. So if you want to support Moore's Law is Dead, try Vite Ramen, and you know, just clicking on that link in the description really helps a ton, but buying their product and using the off code Broken Silicon, of course, helps the channel even more. Try Vite Ramen today. But you're talking about competition in the context of AMD versus Intel. But you'll be aware yes. that Qualcomm has just had their announcement about their, uh, what's the code name for their Snapdragon Elite, X Elite, which is uh, Orion with a Y, isn't it? Um, and when I was, I was in the briefing for the Qualcomm thing, but mobile stuff isn't really my thing, but you, know, you can't ignore Qualcomm. And they did a briefing about this and the, they had their summit in, um, I think they call it a summit in Hawaii, which is, happened last week. And I was genuinely astounded when they're talking about how wonderful this new processor was because they're, they're talking about uh, PCs and mm -hmm. they're showing an image of a laptop. And they've announced partners since, including the likes of Acer and Asus and Samsung and others. Uh, so Qualcomm is talking about doing. They call it PCs, I call it a laptop. And if what they're saying is true, they are truly, they claim competitive against um, Apple. We know new Apple is coming imminently, but current Apple, if Qualcomm can suddenly pull a rabbit out of the hat and produce, you know, a, a processor that is better performance and more efficient than current AMD and current Intel, well, that changes. When does things. it come out, the Qualcomm ah, thing? So they said, uh, they said mid-2024, and I've been told that is June 2024, mm -hmm. um, which is slightly curious. Apart, I mean, if it takes that long, it takes that long. But Qualcomm, as far as I'm aware, has no part of Computex. Mm -hmm. um, so it, oh. I, I guess it's – right. So to, to the best of my knowledge, June 2024 is nothing significant. So that just implies it takes them that long to make it and for their partners to make it. But we're talking here uh, a, a RISC-V processor that runs Windows. Mm -hmm. So you'd think that means that the various laptop manufacturers are obviously familiar with Windows, um, have at least got a bit of a jump on how to do it. Because it sounds as though Qualcomm is taking a bit of a leaf out of um, NVIDIA's book, which is not just, here's a chip, get on with it, boys. It's here's a package of parts you have to have. So the um, voltage regulation hardware, for example, around the processor, I understand is part of the package. I guess memory will be as well because Qualcomm don't mess around. Uh, so it sounds as though, uh, had you asked me this a month ago, two months ago, about laptops next year, it's well, it's Intel and AMD, isn't it? And, or Apple. This is, this is just come out of nowhere as far as I'm concerned. Even though I've heard the name, I had no idea they're going to do Windows laptops. So here is my only concern, though. And actually, I'll, I'll throw in a question here from Travis Gooding because this leads right into this. It says, hey, guys, I'm always happy to tune into these types of discussions. How far off are we from seeing a high-end ARM console? Not a Switch 2, but a truly next-generation leap in risk processing. Well, risk is different than ARM, but for a dedicated gaming device like a PS6 or an unknown competitor entering the market. Well, let me cut this off here and say, I think the PS6 is just going to use AMD again. I think there's some debate sure. about Xbox, but PlayStation for sure is just going to stick with that. Mm. But he goes on and he says, having seen the Apple custom Rosetta layer and activation with M1 and 2 and X86 slash 64 applications running with incredible performance and in some instances better than native OS, will ARM and risk likely to be the next major landscape change in gaming? Or do you feel that for the foreseeable future, x86 
uh, CPUs have their claws in too deep for there to be a paradigm shift. And I brought this in because I prepared an answer to this ahead of time. My answer is show me the money. You know, don't show me a PowerPoint. Show me the money. Show me, beat AMD, then do it. Don't tell <laughs> yeah, me you're yeah, going to yeah, do yeah. it. Don't tell me you're going to do it in two years. And I mean, we've seen Apple come in and I, hey, I'm one of the, I don't, I haven't had a Mac for a very long time. I used to have a MacBook Air a while ago, but the original M1s, you know, I think it's so easy for, or I don't know if it's easy, they, but they do it. A lot of gaming channels just make fun of Apple. But I remember when M1 came out, I was like, hey, this is impressive. Now, granted, it's like a bazillion transistors. I understand why it's impressive. Mm. It's expensive. But this is impressive that they seem to be getting like dedicated graphics performance in something that can game on battery for three hours. This is actually pretty mm. incredible technology I'm seeing here. But Apple stagnated recently, and I can't help but think that a lot of what happened there, or for sure this is what happened, I think, is Intel stagnated, AMD was using inferior nodes, a Apple wasn't using inferior nodes like AMD, and so they just spent their way to making a good version of ARM and had a huge die size. And we've now seen their recent release not that good, you know, and I think this will change with their truly next gen offering they have coming. Mm. But I, I can't help but say it like, look, they were beating everybody because Intel was AFK. And when I, I just looked up this Qualcomm chip, it says that it is going to offer double the CPU performance versus Intel. Right. Which Intel? I looked it up. An i7-1360P. I believe this is a rebranded Alder Lake chip with four big cores and eight little cores. So if this launches in mid-2024, this isn't going to be competing with a mid-tier Alder Lake. This will be competing with Zen 5 Strix. And I don't think it matters what it uses. I don't think it matters if it's ARM, Risk Five. It just matters if it's good. The instruction set, I don't actually think is that important. It depends, to my mind, which sector, which segment of the market you're competing with. Um, so the, the can they do and what does it compete with, it depends. Now, if they're saying we're going to go head to head with the, um, the, the well, the, the, as you say, the next gen of AMD, for example. Or Intel. Go Meteor against, Lake's not even out yet. Oh, you know. Yeah. No, no, absolutely. And with Meteor Lake, of course, we've had plenty of information, um, but we haven't had, you know, as you say, show me the money. Um, we haven't had the uh, core configurations, and we're fairly confident it's two big plus little and uh, eight big plus little. Uh, but as to clock speeds and which SKUs and so on and so forth, obviously now there are he heaps of rumors out there, but as to how it actually functions in the real world, not so sure. Um, will they once again have to rely on NVIDIA for adding graphics? Not mm. so sure. Um, possibly. Yeah, it, uh, in fact, probably. But we don't know. Uh, it could be that Qualcomm's going to rock along and just take away a whole slab of the market potentially um and that in turn even if they don't tackle the high-end high performance gaming and other laptops workstation laptops it could be enough to change the dynamics of the market you mm -hmm. take away a chunk of the market and you leave them with, oh hang on a minute what do we do now we can keep on making the laptops we've got but we have to jack up the price to you know if you think um what was the uh, Azus Rog Zephyrus, their first AMD laptop in. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> I don't uh, know how long. Well, that being a four, four years or something first like that. First proper one. Four. I think they had little cheap ones, but you know those don't sure. really count. And, and, uh, and I took to Computex some years ago, going back to uh, Tim from Hub's uh, comment about gaming laptops. I took a, a an Azus Rog 17 inch laptop with a desktop Ryzen 8 core processor in it. Damn thing weighed a ton, and you know you couldn't leave a main socket. It was terrible. But the Zephyrus 14 with a proper Ryzen processor mm -hmm. with great battery life and so on, it's just like it did everything. It was, and it was a really genuinely good laptop. I mean, the Zeus really did good. How the economics of it worked, I don't know, because I don't believe for a second they just manufactured it and sold it. Someone put some marketing money into that fella. But really great laptop. But if you could take that laptop and make it, as I say, essentially passively cool, wow. Uh, uh, yeah, please take my money because I mean that was that was about two thousand pounds dollars euros, not four grand. It was reasonable money. 
Um, so it depends. But I, I, the Qualcomm thing, I agree. It's so far out of, in terms of time, six months. That's, but, but that's not forever. That's just on the horizon. And therefore, mm-hmm. it's changed my view of 2024 already because I can't ignore it. Yeah, I think there's no way around it. 2024 is going to be a huge laptop showdown between not just Intel and AMD, uh, but also, you know, there will finally be properly, hopefully, a new generation of Apple chips. And then, of course, it seems, I suppose here, that Qualcomm's coming in pretty hard as well. But, you know, when I look at, because I'm looking at Qualcomm's Apple format little grid of squares of all of the things in Mm. this APU. It's funny to see that Apple did that, and now everyone seems to do that as their summary slide. Um, Like, I have to say that I suspect what this would... Oh, here we go. Perfect. Best-in-class performance versus x86, two times faster GPU. So I don't see the teraflops rating here, and if I say something stupid, I really apologize. I don't know if you remember if they announced a teraflops thing. But it seems like they're basically saying they have like a 10 teraflops GPU. Again, please don't quote me in the comments. I'm just looking at without being able to read their fine print. They're like twice as fast as a 4.6 teraflops competitor. Um, Like, you know, Phoenix is at nine teraflops now. And I think Strix, I don't remember exactly what it's going to be at, but it's going from 12 to 16 compute units. So one could deduce that it will at least probably be 12 teraflops. Um, Like, I think where Qualcomm's likely to eat the most lunch is in, as you're probably saying, low-end laptop. And I have to say, that's what I... I'd be really worried about that if I was actually Intel. Because AMD, at least so far... Right, because AMD's targeting like the 28-watt premium. Mm. That's where AMD's going for it right now. I think they're going to try to go everywhere eventually, but that's what they're going for. Then Apple's really expensive... um, With your MacBook Air that you mentioned you got with the the first go-round with the Apple chip, so that it didn't have the, an Apple chip, though. That was a long time ago. Okay. Oh, I see. Okay. Well, well the first go round when when Apple changed from Intel to um, uh, to their own silicon, and we'd had the situation, haven't we, when they've been waiting for Intel to finally give them the damn silicon they've been promising for ages, such that the the Intel powered old silicon they didn't want had the cooler mm-hmm. howling away, and nobody could understand why the cooler was in the wrong place essentially in the corner of the laptop, shifting air in the general vicinity of the inside of the chassis. And the answer was because that wasn't the process that was meant to be in that laptop. It was meant to be a much uh, less power-hungry, much cooler processor. Uh, but as Ice Lake and all the rest, it was a complete you know, disaster. Um, and when Apple switched to their own silicon, and suddenly we saw a laptop that did indeed only need a waft of air to keep everything happy, and that was the difference. Essentially, it was the same laptop, even though they'd gone from Intel to Apple Silicon. However, because it now worked correctly, far less power, as a consequence, mm-hmm. the cooling worked, so the thing didn't require a fan constantly howling away of the process sitting at 100 Celsius. So if Qualcomm can change just that one little thing from the current laptops, because um, I, I noticed in, in some of the emails you sent me, you, re- you referenced, I recently reviewed a PC specialist laptop, uh, 14 inches, some Hong Kong chassis, and the processor was a relatively low power Intel one. So it was in the 28 watts or 35 watts or 45 watts if you pushed it. And it makes all the difference in the world to performance and to cooling. You see, you don't want to go at 28 watts because that sucks. Uh, mm-hmm. But if you go to 35, it's okay. You push to 45, you get almost no gain, and now suddenly it's noisy. Well, we've seen laptops that do 90 watts, and that's terrible. So if you can have the performance of that mid-tier laptop, but with really low power draw, really good battery life, really if you ask the average person what they want from a laptop, what they want is good battery life. Mm-hmm. Everything else is secondary to that. Everything else is secondary. Um, That's why I wish they would have compared it to Phoenix, though, right? Because (laughs) if you compare it to recent comparisons between Raptor Lake and, uh, well, Phoenix or actually Dragon Range, which is really just, Mm. you know, laptop version of Desktop Zen 4. um, I think, what was it? I think Intel's i9 beats AMD's 16-core in laptop if they're using 140 watts or something. 
Like, and there's been recent comparisons too on desktop where if you have both chips at 200 watts, Intel wins by a hair. If you have both chips at 150 watts, AMD wins. If you have both chips at 100 watts, AMD wins by like 20%. If you have both chips at like 35 watts, AMD wins by like 50%. And again, so that's my red flag. They say double the or 68% better power efficiency versus Intel at what power consumption? Because AMD already does that now, like right now. However, how, however there's two points to power things. So when I reviewed, I think Alder Lake, possibly Raptor Lake, but certainly Alder Lake, I ran the i9 at, oh, I can't remember what the thing would be, 190 watts. Uh, and I think you wanted to go to 224 or some such. Raptor Lake went more. And then th- th- they had this thing about efficiency. So if you throttle the power or cap the power more accurately, to I'm going to pick a number, 125 watts, and then there's some much lower setting, like 65 watts. It's really good. And they were quite correct. It absolutely was. But it begs the question, who in their right mind binds a desktop i9 <laughs> and then runs the thing? At, you know, it's like, okay, yeah. and, your, and your point. Um, so, yes, that's true, but kind of so what? But the other thing about the efficiency, if you run a Zen 3 or Zen 4 uh, Ryzen 9 16 core, that's obviously two 8-core chiplets. Mm-hmm they are almost certainly going to be good quality silicon because the eight core parts seem to be now the the best eight cores clearly go into some particular epics because that's where the real money is Uh, and i'm sure that will continue from here to eternity but in the desktop you get a 16 core you get a good one if you get a 12 core part that's two six cores and that tends to be two bits of sucky silicon um Mm -hmm. you can have a 12 core that's obviously not got it's got approximately three quarters of the performance of the 16 core but the power draw will typically in my experience be significantly higher than 16 core significantly mm-hmm. higher and that can only in my book come down to quality of silicon it's not down to clock speed it's running same speed or slightly slower than the 16 core but taking a lot more power to do it so that therefore this zen 3 or zen 4 or pick a pick a family of processors compares to this family which member of the family you're talking about and in, you've actually uh you said something very interesting the other day uh, if i heard you correctly which is that with uh meteor lake and then with arrow lake intel wasn't expecting to be making the processors themselves they're going to use the, the sorry mm-hmm. the compute tiles i apologize because yeah. it's now not a processor the compute with arrow lake specifically use... yeah they they didn't right. think they'd have their node ready right and so which way round is uh, TSMC and um, Intel, which silicon is Intel making? Which part of the product stack is Intel making the silicon for the mega high clock speed, high performance tiles? No, it's making the mm. mega efficient tiles. And again, what's going on there? Because uh, again, if you just to say to me in the past, um, Intel's going to make... Uh, what what I would have once called chips processors, but now it's parts of processors, and they're going to make they'll use their silicon in some part of the product stack, and they'll use TSMC in some other part of the product stack. I would have assumed, based on no information, mm-hmm. well, Intel's obviously going to have the high end, even if it takes a bunch of juice. TSMC will get the bread and butter, and it's the exact reverse. Intel's yeah, and, and for the I don't remember files. up the top of my head which leak it was, but it was like I don't know half a year ago where I really asked a bunch. Uh, I think I think a lot of people skip or don't remember this part of it. Like a major part of it was I tried to outline what parts of Arrow Lake will go to TSMC, what parts will mm. go to mm. Intel, and it became clear that pretty much TSMC for the CPU tiles is going to be used for the top half of the stack, including mobile. Mm. And then 20A is going to be used for i5 and lower. And what that tells you is even to this day, Intel isn't so sure (laughs) that 20A is actually as good as 3 nanometer, even though they like to say it is. Well, then why aren't you using it for the flagship chip? Why are you using it for i3s? But but that that, that depends on what it is they want it to do, because obviously good, but we're now in the... 
I think that tells you, you it doesn't you clock to, as high, but it might be more efficient. Right, well, yeah. right, right. But yeah, you're having to define now what good means, because just as we used to think we understood what a processor was, what a chip was, what a CPU was, it's all one and the same thing. Mm -hmm. And now it's not. The Meteor Lake, which is clearly the way Intel's going in the future, um, is a base tile and four uh, tiles. And so you've got the EMIP uh, underneath, and you've got the four tiles. You've got uh, graphics, to compute, I.O., and display. And my understanding right. is Arrow Lake will look basically the same. Like it. If, if we were to draw an analogy, Meteor Lake is Zen 2, Arrow Lake is Zen 3. Like the platform, the organization looks the same. This is their base yeah. design, and then but, they're iterating. But when, when you're saying um, Intel isn't good enough, therefore they'll have to use TSMC, as you say, because and our brains fill in the thing, which is... Well, that's what they the thought a few years ago. Run. We sure. won't know until it comes out. Now, however, my, my feeling is that their definition of good has changed. Now, whether this is Intel manipulating mm. me with their you know, fear, uncertainty, doubt, marketing. Um, uh, no, no, no. When we say good, what we mean is efficient. We don't mean we don't mean grunt. We don't mean pure performance. And the thing is, that sounds like complete BS. But uh, if God help us, the AI part of all these SOCs is going to start having more of function, then it doesn't necessarily mean they require a grunty processor to do the processing. It, because after all, we, we have a user experience. You know, if they could do um, if they can do work locally rather than having to pop off to the cloud and back again and such like that'll speed up latency hugely. And therefore, your experience will be zipping along on no power whatsoever. So either their, their stuff sucks and therefore they have to use TSMC, which on, on past history could completely be true, or they're moving. On. I mean, here, here's a, uh, a question. So just recently, Intel had an event in Ireland at their fab. Mm -hmm. um, to announce that they are now producing Meteor Lake EUV, uh, using EUV, and it's the first commercial production or some such wording of EUV. Um, they had very few journals there because it was essentially a business thing. They had some Irish policy. I, I did a video on Kit Guru about it because I was just interested. I was, and it's the way of... I think I watched it, yeah. nailed. Oh, uh, well, I hope it wasn't terrible. But, but as you know, it's essentially at this moment, this is the state of play, and even if it's not true, it's what I believe. And then next week or next month or whatever, when stuff comes out, we're like, oh, okay, things have changed. How have they changed? Was I wrong or has the ground shifted? And here's my question. Intel at Fab, whatever the heck it is in Ireland, is doing using EUV to produce Meteor Lake chips. What are they producing in Ireland? What exactly are they producing in Ireland? They're not Didn't they announce Meteor they're going to make... Intel 3, and then they say Intel 3 is going to be yeah, there. They're, they're starting on 4, they're moving to 3 there, and then, and then after that 20A and 18A go to Ireland. My point is, you're correct about the process, it's 4 going to 3, and it's EUV. Mm -hmm. But what they're producing in Ireland, by definition, can only be the compute tiles of Meteor Lake, because mm -hmm. everything else is TSMC. Or maybe the EMIB is coming out of Ireland, I don't know, that could be coming out of well, Israel, possibly, who knows. Um, but another Intel fan. But the it's the compute tile that's coming mm -hmm. out. But we also know TSMC has their hand in that. So uh, when they've made this grand announcement, and, and it's also a bid for money from the EU for the German fab in Magdeburg, which they obviously want money to help build. Um, actually, our understanding in the past was Intel is making chips in Ireland and their chips. End of story. And they'll go on your laptop. When you look at your laptop, it's got Meteor Lake. Now it's part of Meteor Lake mm -hmm. might be coming out of Ireland. Other parts are definitely coming out of TSMC, which at the minute means Taiwan, because you know the American mm. tabs aren't up and running. And as I understand it, some of the compute tiles are also TSMC. So it's a bit of some Meteor Lakes is coming out of Ireland. And I, I, I have to tell myself that because that is totally different to anything we've ever heard before with Intel. Totally different. Well, it's different in terms of tiles. And then, of course, Intel 3 will make Granite Rapids there. Um, mm. But I remember there were Ivy Bridge chips that could have a stamp 
I remember because I don't remember if mine was the Costa Rica one or not, but some of them came out of Costa Rica and some of them came out of other areas. So, I mean, they've dual produced things from multiple fabs before. I, I distinctly remember oh, Ivy Bridge was one. Right. But in this case, the, the best, uh, obviously, Intel would say the whole the whole thing is ours. Therefore, what the heck if we have to source stuff from wherever the heck? I mean, nobody thought less. Nobody thinks less of AMD because they use global foundries for one uh, you know, when, when they use them for the IO die and then they use TSMC for chiplets and then they switch to TSMC, you know, it's, they're fabulous. It's not a thing. In Intel's case, they've also got Intel foundry services. They are selling themselves as a foundry to other people whilst getting all their stuff made oh, by TSMC. Oh, I see. So what you're getting at is, can they really claim they have their own foundries if all their chips require them I, to I, work anyway? I, I'm genuinely, it's a good question. <laughs> I, I'm going around the spiral on this thing. It's the strangest thing because it, it, it it's my, my feeling is when you think life makes sense, it means you don't understand what's going on. And once mm-hmm. you start to understand more about it and you start to dig into it and you go, huh, okay, it turns out I know nothing. And then you start asking some questions and then you, you come back with, okay, I've asked, I've asked the wrong guy because he's in the wrong department. He knows a bit of it. He knows his bit of the world. He doesn't know the whole thing because who does know the whole world? And, and in this case, the meat, the, the, the Irish thing, because you know all the business journals, uh, mm-hmm. the Irish thing, were reporting, it's great, Ireland leads the world, Ireland's beating Taiwan. <laughs> no, but they're still using well. it, yeah. <laughs> right, right. And, and, in, and you know perfectly well in Taiwan that they're busy saying, we lead the world, the world needs us. Um, it, it, it's, it's two completely different stories going on in parallel. Um, it, it fascinates well, so me. I actually, mentioned- I like the point you're bringing up though, because I think number one, it is totally fair to point out that Intel's claims that they have their own foundries is not really true in the next two years because <laughs> everything they have, if they ever launch battle mage, that's coming out of TSMC as well. Like all of these right. things are coming from other people. They can't really claim they're their own foundry anymore. Now, Having said that, my understanding is, and I just put out a leak about Arrow Lake refresh and stuff, that mm. this is a byproduct of them not being sure what their future was a couple of years ago. Like, I think <laughs> yeah. Meteor Lake, God, I leaked the code name, Redwood Cove, in like 2020. So Meteor Lake was planned a very long time ago. Mm. My guess is that was always going to use Intel 3 for the main node. And they started, or Intel 4, I mean, and they started sourcing to everyone else for the other tiles in case it sucked. And then T- yeah. and then Arrow Lake and Arrow Lake Refresh will use TSMC predominantly. And that is because they really didn't believe in themselves when Arrow Lake was in the planning state. You have to buy this capacity years ahead of time. And mm. I was actually told recently that the 20A version of Arrow Lake, they came up with that, I think, like a year ago. Like, this wasn't something they were always planning to do. But now their foundries are performing better, so they're going to do that. And I think... Panther Lake supposed to be all Intel with Intel 18A being the lead. And certainly, I guess I still have notes here that I'm looking on something on the side that Nova Lake still is supposed to use TSMC 2 nanometer. But if they can, they'll move to Intel 14A or something. So what I would say, I said, I think you can have the criticism of Intel, which is very fair. Um, My devil's advocate argument would be a lot of this is a byproduct of a chaotic period, and I'm Mm. guessing they're going to try to be all Intel by 2027, if not 2026. So this is going to be a weird time where we have all this stuff going on because they don't know if they can do it. But if they get to a place where they feel comfortable, they want to bring as much capacity back to their own fabs as they can. Having said that, I think they also realize that TSMC is really good at helping you with hard designs, diversifying your capacity. My guess would be they'll still use TSMC for graphics tiles and here and there other tiles for a very long time. It's just eventually, you know, they can, you know, hopefully move everything back. And I suppose they would also argue if Pat Gelsinger was in this conversation, he would go, well, look, if a war in Taiwan happened, we can move it to our node. They can't. And and that's the argument he would make. But they're not now. You've touched on a point I was going to make there. So I take it the reason you're saying Intel wants to move from TSMC to Intel, apart from because it's Intel, you know, we we make our own stuff. Uh, Real men have fabs, as um, (laughs) Jerry Sanders said many years ago. Um, But the thing is, I, I would say that the more immediate priority for Intel is to manufacture not in Taiwan. Mm. That that would strike me as the bigger deal. 
Um, Intel made in the in the quarter they just did a billion dollars net, I believe. I think AMD's making about a billion dollars net in a quarter at the moment. Nvidia's making ten <laughs> or yeah. something. Um, which, apart from showing the, the relative weight of those three companies, which are so important in our world, but in the event there's a problem with Taiwan, uh, that's going to give both AMD and NVIDIA monumental problems. If Intel can shift production to America in their own fabs, and, and after Ireland, so for 20A, then 18A, those are due to be Oregon, I believe. Um, or is it Ohio? One of the uh, America, anyway. Ohio. Then, then not only do they have uh, they're on track, and they've got um, security of supply. They've also got the American Chips Act money. Mm -hmm. uh, they're in a position so where TSMC. they can say, right now, I think Intel will be far less uh, concerned about manufacturing at TSMC in the states. I think that I think I think they will treat the Meteor Lake uses 6 nanometer as well, which is I think coming online with TSMC as well. So right. I think maybe so, there's some planning there too. So right, so we know that T we know that TSMC is slow rolling the fabs in America partly at the minute apparently they've got labor problems with you chaps, but um, they want the American fabs to be a node or two behind or however many it is behind Taiwan because that's their protection. We, we mm -hmm. know this. Um, but when Intel has the option of producing in America, whether it's Intel or TSMC, then I think they'll jump at it. And I think probably strategically, I've no idea what uh, wafer throughput t uh, TSMC will be able to do in America once they start rolling. But if Intel can grab up as much of that as they can and therefore prevent their competition from grabbing it up, I think that will suit them on a number of different levels if they can do it. And they've been, they've been a customer of TSMC, after all, for a very long while. Whereas Team Green, as we know, mm. uh, are, should, should we say they are um, fab agnostic? They're not loyal people, are they? Mm. Um, you know, they jump and they jump and they jump, and then they say, no, no, we, we're not, we want a discount. And when they're told no, they get quite shocked and go off to Samsung. Um, and, you Which know, they kind of regret, they, by the way, from what I hear. Well, but. Of course, of, of course they do. But but um, uh, it's it, we we can't say that Jensen has failed, can we? No, <laughs> no, and, and it's a, it's a thing they kind of regret that turned out in their favor because there were shortages and they just had all the Samsung mm. capacity. Yes, it, it's uh, th that man has the ability to turn every catastrophe into a triumph. It's it's the most remarkable track record. He's truly the one of the most impressive CEOs in my lifetime. Uh, he, he leaves me breathless. Every time you think that company's on the verge of potentially a bankruptcy, he turns it around and turns it into a trial. Well, and I've often been like, well, for this to work, Jensen would have to time this perfectly. But he, he always fucking does. <laughs> he always does. So I can't, I have to be so careful, like, questioning him because... Yeah, at least so far, it's maybe it's just he flipped a coin and got heads five times in a row. But there's a part that of me that goes, it. "Well, if someone gets it five times in a row, I'm not gonna. Maybe I'll just stay out of this game until they get a tails." My girlfriend likes dressing up our pets, and heck, I do too sometimes. Probably a lot more than they like it themselves. But you know what's scarier than being dressed up by a giant human like a strawberry or a tomato? Well, that's overpaying for Microsoft software, and that is why you should go to cdkeyoffer.com during their Halloween sales event. Whether it's Microsoft operating systems, Office products, or many of the latest games, cdkeyoffer.com provides PC gamers with a product that I honestly think this community needs, and that's just avoiding monopolistic prices on software, especially Windows and Office products. And you know, the Moore's Law is Dead team has been working with this company for a very long time, and still does for a reason. They've been good to us, they've been good to the community. Heck, recently I got my girlfriend a new compact gaming PC as an early Christmas present, and when it came time to set up the office software, I realized she was paying a lot of money for a year for Microsoft 365, and she was blown away to realize that that was a predatory service, and you can get Microsoft Professional 2021 Office 
for like $50 and then you're done. And you know what? You can get that around $50 cost if you just use the offer code Broken Silicon for 25% off. And you can use the code Die Shrink as well to get 3% off every other piece of software on the website, whether it's Steam, EA, or Ubisoft keys. Using either of these codes, Broken Silicon or Die Shrink helps support Wars Laws Dead a ton, and it saves you money. So support this channel by supporting CDKeyOffer.com during their Halloween sales event today. It, the, the guy the guy would appear to be a savant of course this mm -hmm. is this is true so many people who have great track record and when of course they trip up they go well we all saw that one coming um <laughs> but he he uh bearing, bearing in mind he was big crypto for example and all the mining stuff well that's yeah the way i put it he laundered now. the crypto bubble into the ai bubble <laughs> right and so so for me the thought there is uh, and it's a totally different thought is what comes next? Because this um, AI thing at the prices people are paying, what they're paying, 70000 for a thing that's listed at 20000 well, They're not anymore. I, from what I've heard, it's already softening, actually. Um, well, actually, yeah. before I get to that, though, let me bring up the, the, the Taiwan thing, because I just want to throw this a couple ideas out there since we're touching mm. on it. Like, you know, I think Intel's ability to leverage their fab locations to beat their competition over the head that really only will work if they are at least tied or significantly ahead of the competition because if they are then i think the u.s government and really all western governments will say well intel's ahead intel has the fabs let's pay intel they can do this but we have mm. to remember that back in world war ii the inventor of the jeep which every military ended up using eventually did not really make a lot of money off of it. Like they invented the Jeep in a competition and other automotive companies made their version of, you know, a little car you could drive around with a machine gun on it. And Jeep won. And then the U.S. government said, Jeep won. Guess what? Now GM and everyone else is going to make it <laughs> because we have a war to win. And were there to be a war in Taiwan where capacity was cut off to the rest of the world, if AMD was significantly ahead of them, if NVIDIA was significantly ahead of them in AI... I will promise you the U.S. government will say, too bad, Intel, you're making AMD processors, because that's what's happened every single time something like this happened in the past. And I want to say this because it sounds hmm. crazy to everybody listening. Um, I won't say which OEM, but I've heard from an executive at one of them that they said, yeah, I think Intel will make AMD chips eventually or something. So it all matters. Can Intel get its architectures working? Because if they can't, Intel can just make other people's chips. I mean, we saw the same thing happen with Global Foundries, used to be part of AMD, got spun off, then now makes, well, now makes much weaker stuff. But, you know, I, so I, I, I don't see thought, it as a golden bullet, is what I would say. Sure. To follow your thought, though, if Intel was not restricted by capacity, so if Intel had enough capacity to be able to manufacture for both both for themselves and also for, well, let's go the whole hog. If they manufacture for themselves and for Apple and for NVIDIA and Which for Which they AMD, have done Apple if, before. Sure. If, every, if everything was going through uh, some, I don't know how many foundries that would require in America, but let's face it, TSMC has got an awful lot of fabs in Taiwan and is a very small country compared to America. So if Intel was to open fab, 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 then why not? And let's face it, if Taiwan has problems, then ASML's got to sell the machines to someone. Mm -hmm. So why wouldn't they just ship everything across the Atlantic? But, or your, your other companies, your LAM, your um, applied materials, and so on and so forth. So it all goes to various Intel plants. Intel could be the last you know fab because after all if you've got problems in in that neck of the woods in the south china sea i mean how can it not affect samsung mm -hmm. but geographically they're on you know it's, it's a horrible horrible neck of the it, 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 it's a nasty situation so if intel could only manufacture a certain number of wafers in america in a given period of time you know, per month as we typically talk and the government said, well, fine, in that case, you're making the good stuff, which means AMD. But like, oh, damn. If AMD was but, better, yeah. But, but if, if they could actually manufacture it and do enough wafer starts to do everything, 
and also all the car manufacturers, all those, you know, Teslas, all the rest of it. Mm. I shouldn't mm. think Intel be upset about that in the slightest because it means probably as your, your government would have to take away uh, all the all the monopoly rules, wouldn't they? Be like, sure, Intel, you can manufacture everything for everybody. I mean, uh, I can see in that circumstance they'd love it, but if they had to, you know, they've only got 20,000 wafer starts, damn it, mm. we're doing AMD. They'd hate that. So, well, so this uh, is also touching on a thing that, because you know, I've talked to a lot of people behind the scenes, like, what do you think would happen if this happens? And I think people, when they, when you'll see like an analyst go, well, Intel's poised to be more protected if a war in Taiwan happens. I can't say huh. that's wrong. Like, I guess literally if it was a yes or no question, yes, they are. But People I've talked to, the biggest concern they have if there was, again, so let's be clear what we're saying here. If there was a world war, like the estimates I've heard is China would need like a million people to invade Taiwan. This would be an insane war mm. if it actually happened. Mm. Uh, e- even some sort of blockade would be a very nasty situation where the US and Australia and Japan, possibly Vietnam, like uh, yada, 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 all respond. Uh, Philippines, I mean, this is massive scale war here if it actually happened. I don't think the biggest consideration is just silicon because people I've talked to say all of our heat sinks come out of China. All of our PCBs come out of China. All of the assembly comes out of China. It doesn't matter what capacity Intel has. You're not making anything for anyone for three years because we don't have any of the infrastructure to assemble it, package it, and do it in the U.S. And I'm talking cheap stuff, like put those capacitors on a PCB board and ship it. We would have years of probably not being able to do that large scale, and that's going to hold up any silicon manufacturing capacity so i would just say and then you bring up samsung what would happen they would certainly probably get involved you know uh, south korea would then north korea would get involved then russia would i think our considerations we'd probably have bigger fish to fry than if intel can make <laughs> you know because there's you so see, many other things but you but you're suge- you're suggesting that the, but you're suggesting the prc would actually uh, do a massed invasion of taiwan and I, and I don't see why they need to do that. The thing being is, surely what the PRC needs to do is to uh, remove Taiwan's our critical need for Taiwan. What we mm. need from Taiwan are chips and other things. But as we know, a huge number of these companies actually manufacture in the PRC. But TSMC is in Taiwan. And I would I would suggest that under your previous president and now your current president, we've had uh, rounds of sanctions on the PRC, uh, which have just been ramped up more, haven't they? Such that now uh, not only A100 and H100 from NVIDIA mm-hmm. are covered by sanctions, but now 4090s are uh, thought to be potentially covered by sanctions, which are a bit fluid. So supposedly there's not going to be a 4090 available for the next few months because every graphics card manufacturer with a but, scrap of common sense is going to ship to PRC. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. I thought um, there's not going to be in here. Yeah, there will be in China because yeah, they're going to yeah, ship yeah, all of it there. Yeah. Yeah. Because you'll ship them there because they mm. might not be able to buy them legitimately in a few months' time. So get them over there, and then anyone with a scrap of common sense over in that neck of the woods is going to grab them while they can. So they'll, mm. they'll, they'll pay through the nose. Um, and there you go. So in the event, uh, so, so the sanctions on China, which have ratcheted up and ratcheted up and now cover things like the Chinese are unable to buy, um, this, this, they can't, they can't buy ASML kits to make the processes they want. That recent Huawei phone is apparently on the equivalent of seven nanometer, the, mm-hmm. um, out of SMIC. Um, although apparently people think the yields might be rubbish. But they've managed to make something pretty good on a process that's the end of the line for them with the current technology they have. Um, so that's the line drawn. So it seems to me that the sanctions that your leaders have imposed, as though your country is at war with the PRC, because I don't know why they brought in the sanctions as such. The purpose, mm-hmm. we can see the purpose, but w- what's the motive? You're not at war with China. So, you know, uh, it's, I, I, it's, no, go on. Well, so it would seem to me that the, the idea is to prevent the, 
you know, we've heard the expression um, trying to prevent the rise of um, China. And that clearly isn't a thing because China continues to rise. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, well, it's a huge. I mean, they're about to default on the biggest amount of debt in human history. So we'll see what happens after that. But, sure, but, but, but then, I mean, I think, I think the American national debt is $30 trillion or something. Um, so thankfully you have the no, reserve. No, no, I know, but um, the way China has these ghost cities, though, and they don't, like, the problem, oh, the thing oh, with yeah, America yeah, yeah. is you, it's easy, to be honest, for America to launder the money into anything else, whereas with China, I mean, what, Bitcoin took off there because you can invest in real estate or Bitcoin, and they took yeah. away Bitcoin, so now they're just building ghost cities. No, you're right. I mean, Evergrande, the, the property developer in, in China, is, is on the verge of absolutely imploding, um, but then but the government's going to do something about that. And they've got a do, huge but. demographic issue coming where they're, you know, I don't know the exact number, but because of the one child policy and because mm. of like, it, you know, boomers are a huge generation and basically every country, like so many mm. people have babies in that time period. Because of that also, they had millennials. Millennials are actually going to be much bigger than Gen Z. Well, this, you know, rounding out of the demographics per generation in China, it's in Russia, by the way, it's even more truncated by the famines and other things that happened in their history to the point where like, and then they had the one child policy. So whatever issues we're going to have taking care of our elders in the West, China's going to have more of them and less kids to take care of them. You know, so to oh. answer your previous question, why would China actually risk this large scale war? And my hope is they wouldn't. And I don't like putting a percentage on it. I guess the way I'd characterize it is I'm not convinced it's going to happen, but I also am not convinced because the question becomes, is he crazy? <laughs> you know, and they wow. won't have the young people to fight a war in 10 years. And this is, you know, a regime that boards up people's doors and cements the highways, you know? So I don't know, is he actually going to try this? Because if he is, it, it, it does have to be in the next 10 years. And if he's not, it's a bit of what happened to Japan's economy. Is he going to accept that it might plateau and too bad? So your 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 point, uh, um, uh, rather your your point. So the the sanctions would appear to be uh, to prevent China from improving their technologies in a number of areas, which obviously all lead towards military and also uh, AI. Know, this is something that's not my decision; it's my government's. But oh, I no, would no, 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 no. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not blaming you for the situation in that part of the world in the slightest. Obviously, um, uh, th I that's would suspect the point, U.S. government is. knows there's only so much they can do, but they want China's. AI and server infrastructure to always be one to two right. generations behind. They know but, it will catch up, but they always want them behind. Right. But le leaving aside the small point, which as far as I'm aware, none of you over there voted for this because nobody's asked you. I mean, it's just like <laughs> this thing that's just appeared, which is, which is what I find so curious about it. It seems like an incredibly significant move. And it, it would have been quite nice. At some, uh, I'm not aware. I mean, you're, your next election's a year away. I, mm -hmm. I'm not particularly hearing um, it. You know, the should we or should we not doesn't seem to be a question. There's you know, other questions, but not that one doesn't seem to be a thing. Most just people seem to, be, seem to be on the same page on what's going on. with every, uh, There's right. a lot of hawkishness from everyone towards China right now. Right. Yeah. But, but it's, it's the, the concern about um, uh, industrial espionage and stuff like that and balloons flying over the middle of your country and things like you know, that. I think some of that's kind of revenge, too, to answer your question, because you, um, you know China does steal a lot of people's stuff. And oh, cool. I remember a documentary I watched where it was like, they. I think it's not illegal. It's illegal to steal IP within China from another Chinese country company it is not illegal yeah. to steal it you know so there's all these like double standards that i i would suspect lobbyists are trying to get the government to punish china well, for i think it, the only which, thing the, the the only success in that field you had i think was hollywood um because there was uh, they were selling zero blu-rays in china because <laughs> you know, literally it, every single one was a knockoff and it was like no 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 you got to stop this and it was just let, okay. Let, let's keep we, we want the movies let's keep you happy so of course they instead went to the route and they make you change the movies to not be critical but um now my point was that if if the idea is that as of the sanctions kicked off a couple of years ago didn't they is that if the idea is that in the future or uh, you, you're slowing china's progress in certain technical fields therefore and i imagine china was already behind america because after all america is is monumental um the gap is going to increase uh, it's mm. only going to increase over time if if the sanctions hold. If they can't buy 
next node, next node, they, and they can't buy the products. They mm -hmm. can't buy NVIDIA stuff and so on. And we know that the the volume of, uh, say, GPUs that are involved in, in AI, you know, Tesla and Amazon is at 20,000, 50,000, 100,000, hence Jensen making 10 billion in the quarter. Those are the numbers we're talking about. Take your 10 billion, divide it by 10, 20,000 US dollars. Those are the volumes you're talking about. They are mm -hmm. immense. That's a lot of stuff. It's got to come from somewhere. People would notice you're smuggling it. So the gap is going to increase. So if China was to wait 10 years, then mm. there'll be a worse, it'll make much harder for them to take Another action. Another argument for why. Are they crazy enough to do right. it? Because if they are, they've got right. to do it sooner, not later. But, but, but there, there's an element of if they are not allowed to buy the stuff with their own hard-earned cash, or rather the, the interest on the American debt that they hold, if they can't buy the good stuff out of Taiwan because of the sanctions or the ASML machines or the kit from uh, Applied Materials and, and mm -hmm. LAM and all the other companies, and there's even been aggravation um, to do with Micron and SK Hynix and such like, people getting upset about you know, which memory are you, are you not using? Uh, because, again, yeah, South Korea. Um, it, it's so... Why would China care if every single fab in Taiwan suddenly stopped working because they put a missile through the roof? Mm -hmm. They're not allowed to buy the stuff from it. What do we care? And if they if they did something of that order of magnitude, which would be immense, and then, as you say, America, Europe cannot make most of these things. We don't have the materials. You know, uh, as you, I mean, you're an automotive chap. You know full well that uh, things like... The, all the rare earths for, for motors and magnets and god knows what else i believe got. they just discovered another giant you know pocket of that though in the northeast mm. or northwest of the u.s mm. though at least oh, but you closed your minds down because it's it's just economics the, these materials are all over the world but the chinese produce 90 mm. plus percent of a great many elements but that's what i'm saying I, right if this goes mm. down it's just going to be three years of no one can make anything anyways and then they'll find ways to make right. it in other places. But it's going to so take three, three years. So for three years, do, do you truly think, if, if, mm. if let's take uh, not the worst case scenario, because uh, the worst case scenario involves people dying. Sure. But in the, in the event China was to lob missiles through the roof of each and every TSMC facility in Taiwan, hopefully killing nobody, but wrecking everything. Yeah. Would America then refuse to buy all the things from China that China currently sells them. They'd want to, you would want to, but could you? Could you actually say, no, we're not going to buy motors and lithium and copper? I, 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 don't you know, know, I don't know you'd want, I don't know you'd be able to. If you look it up, though, China actually doesn't, like Russia is the biggest country with natural resources, and then America, and then Canada. And, <laughs> and you know, South America <laughs> actually has... Well, but see what I'm saying is China doesn't, yeah. Yeah. all of their infrastructure or a lot of it is built around the system that we have. So I think mm. the question goes both ways. And that's not to say that that makes it any less sucky for any other country in the West. It is to say, mm. though, I think the reason China would be very hesitant, and that's why I brought up, like, if they stopped Western countries from being able to manufacture things, I mean, that's what's going to stop us, not Taiwan being blown up. But the reason they wouldn't well, do President, that is once they did that, President, they're never going yeah, back, sure. though. And that's why they wouldn't. Sure. But Pre President Xi has said something along the lines of uh, in his time, you know, Taiwan will become, will revert. I know. And, and so, so the question becomes bearing in mind he's extended his, um, his uh, uh, rule, his reign, call it what you will, his term of office. Term of office is more polite uh, beyond the norm. Uh, but he's not a young man. Um, you no. would think to take your, to, to, uh, I think your figure of 10 years, that's probably the outer limit. Um, so that would seem to be the time frame we're talking about. And 10 years is the end of the line. No one wants to do that kind of thing at the end. They want people to go, you did it. Great. And bearing in mind, I, I speak here as a Brit. So we were once the workshop of the world a very, very long time ago. The Industrial Revolution came from us, you know. We had Hong Kong, albeit we got it by very nefarious means, and it reverted to China. And we've seen exactly how that's worked out. So, as a Brit, 
I, I feel I have a slightly closer connection to how these things go than say how. Well, give some credit to the, the Germans, people across the pond, though, and Europe. They had their Absolutely. factories no, 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 too. No. No, 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 cat- categorical. But I, I suppose um, early 1800s, though. I mean, yeah, it was the UK. That yeah, really yeah, no, 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 no. The, the, the original Industrial Revolution. But, um, but uh, how things go over there? I'm, I'm. It strikes me that the sanctions on China, which seems like a bit of a questionable move, but that's how it is. And now, who's going to unroll them? You know, it's, it, it doesn't really work like that, does it? It ratchets one way, and to unroll it is a really big deal. And it seems to me that someone somewhere has set the clock ticking which is mm. why um, uh, ver- various of your investors have got out of Taiwan because they consider it to be a jolly bad deal because it's just unknowable. That's the thing. It's unknowable. If it goes bad, it goes really bad. Mm. Um, it might keep on going forward. But President Xi said what he said, or it's been reported with what he said, uh, and there's no denying that Intel wants fabs in America. TSMC has been made to get fabs in America. Mm-hmm. Quite bluntly, they just are. Um, and then we're starting to argue about small details, like at the minute, um, HBM memory on graphics is a really big deal. Therefore, the packaging is a really big deal, you know, Kawas from TSMC and such like. So will SK Hynix be manufacturing in America and then will TSMC be packaging HBM? It's like, which is relatively speaking a detail, but it's a hell of an important detail. Um, that's the kind of realm you're in. Whilst, you know, on the one hand, you're imagining missiles going off in taiwan and i i've been there six times i think uh i love the place it's a great great place lovely people it would be an absolute tragedy if this thing was to happen but it seems to me that that's accelerating whilst at the same time america has got every incentive to manufacture as as many wafers as they can in america Mm -hmm. plus europe well i think that's the question right you know and it goes for europe as well like it's not just the wafers start like if they want to actually protect themselves, they have to move all of the other manufacturing to some degree out of that area as well. And let's be clear. It doesn't need to be in America. It could be in Mexico, it could be in Brazil. I mean, there's plenty of places we can make things with plenty of smart yeah, and skilled people. Jobs for America's got such a good ring, hasn't it? Um, I mean, I, well, it I does until question- you try to get them to work. And then apparently TSMC <laughs> runs into some problems, but yeah. <laughs> Uh, I just sorry. I felt, I felt the need to say that just just out of malice. Um, the the I asked a question of one of the. I did this um, Intel trip to Malaysia um, a couple of months ago now to um, to see the packaging plant there. So they took us to Israel uh, before the lockdown, mm-hmm. and they took us to Israel after lockdown for Raptor Lake, and then they took us to Malaysia um, a couple of months ago to see packaging, which again shows the importance. Um, this is fabrication. This is packaging. Uh, and you go, huh, interesting to see all this good stuff, you know, because normally you don't get to see it. But the uh, tier, uh, Intel's man of uh, building uh, has agreed to build, but has not yet started to build a fab in Magdeburg in Germany and a packaging plant in Poland, um, which is therefore just over the border, obviously, both the EU nations. Um, both of them quite clearly dependent on a lot of money coming out of the EU, crystal mm-hmm. clear. Um, I don't know what a packaging plant costs. A fab is ten billion or some such at leading edge. And as mentioned, both AMD and Intel are making about a billion net per quarter. So you need a lot of quarters to get one fab. So they want the Europeans to pay for that, and then in America you want chips from America to pay for it, and that's fifty. Is it fifty billion that's been allocated chips to act? chips from America? It's yeah. somewhere around there, I think. Yeah. And then you've got those other programs which you hear about ramp and ship, um, which essentially are, as I understand it, making sure that the chips going into American military hardware comes from trusted sources. To which mm-hmm. Intel says, "You mean us, don't you?" <laughs> um, and I think that goes to what you're saying, which is, I don't know who those chips would be made for but there wouldn't be i don't think intel chips but they'd be made in intel fabs right um which so yes i think if intel can become chip maker to absolutely everybody then uh, that will suit them very nicely indeed particularly with that sweet sweet american taxpayers money well so but that's the thing that i think it becomes a more interesting uh, well, i shouldn't say more but another interesting conversation 
is when we talk about Intel's fab advantage and all of this stuff, I think people get caught up in stopping at like step one and not getting to step 10, which is they're just like, they can make stuff here, AMD can't. And it's actually quite a lot more to that. They can also make things for the American military. They can also have like, you know, if sales go crazy, they can say, well, hey, that means we can for Air Lake make a bunch of I-5s at least at our fabs and stuff Mm. like that. You know, it's much more, I think, giving them, how would I put it? I would say Intel's fab advantage, in my opinion, is much more of like, it's less of like a, if this was a video game, like an RPG, it's less of like a killer attack and more of they just have a ton of HP because they're all of these different things that everyone relies on. But that means Intel's not going anywhere. Anyone who thinks, or... But the question becomes interesting, but will they be the same company in 10 years? And this is where I attempt to, I was thinking of this like a few minutes ago, how do I even steer back on to talking about some of these gamer things after we talked about World War III? It feels so inept, but let me attempt. But like, how do you see Intel's, like, because they're not going to go out of business, but if their architectures aren't competitive, yeah, they'll just become a different company like IBM did. And from a gamer's perspective or a PC hardware reviewer's perspective, that really will change who they are. And I'm just curious because my question isn't, can Intel survive in a vacuum? My question is, can they get back on track fast enough for it to matter? And that gets us into next year with like Turin versus Granite Rapids. And I'm curious how you see that panning out, how you see Meteor Lake versus Strix panning out and how you see Arrow Lake versus, well, really Zen 6 to a certain degree panning out. Because my my concern is that they seem a generation behind in everything and they're still making effectively no margin on data center. And I'm just worried, do they have enough time to get back to where they need to be if one or more of their competitors goes into overdrive next year? Well, so you, you mentioned the Granite Rapids, but the fact that you've got this thing where you've got server chips and you've got big cores and little cores to use the terminology and then uh, it definitely feels as though so intel's going with e cores and e cores and the two very different kinds of cores whereas it feels as though amd is going down the big cores and they're varying the amount of cash to make them smaller cores you, know, you can get more cores on if you have less cash on them or as you i think you said the other day or what if you have cores in the stack 3D cache on top of those in your mm-hmm. servers? Um, so different approaches to do different things. And I don't see why all those approaches don't have their place. But then at the same time, we've got an awful lot of ARM stuff going on. I think at the minute, um, Dylan mm-hmm. Patel at Semi Analysis was saying just today, I think, that Amazon, whatever the, the name of the thing is they're renting, the, the, the money per core they're selling it for is stupidly cheap which Mm -hmm. therefore he says means they've got no demand and and that's just their ticket price the actual price you actually pay is discounted monumentally which means that they can't you know amazon web services has problems selling services on their own stuff which of course is their own processors and then there are all these other um arm risk five god knows what Mm -hmm. else things out there in addition to amd and um intel and as we know, NVIDIA is selling services. If you want to, if you want to get your mitts on um, graphics that you can't get your mitts on, buy a pod. What they've got, DGX pods and all the other three-letter acronyms that they've got selling for lots of money. Um, so in isolation, it seems to me that Intel's biggest issue in the immediate is if the power draw is crazy high, well, then you've limited how many of these things you can get mm. into your X yeah. megawatts of power and cooling. And that's just the end of that. You know, it's absolutely brilliant. If you walk in a room and there's three racks because you can't handle any more, you're, you're screwed. Um, and then the question of how many halls you have in any one box becomes a detail. But you're, yeah, so you're touching on though the thing that I'm concerned about with Intel, which is that. You know, I I put the roadmaps out there too. So this isn't just like a you know trust me bro situation. Like you've 
AMD is going to have, as far as I've seen on roadmaps, at least three nanometer and four nanometer variants of Zen five in production, uh, mm-hmm. probably starting production, frankly, in like a month to two from now. And what that means is first half of next year. Right, so just that- to cut in, we're, we're expecting Zen five to f- drop in about April of next year, or we not. Yeah, I mean, I think if they wanted to, they could do a little sooner. It just depends, you know, how big of a launch they want and which one they want to launch first. Is it going to be Ryzen or Turin first, right? But what we can say is early next year, they should have a 128 core Zen 5. And remember, Granite Rapids goes up to at least 120 cores. You know, it depends if they can enable a few extras. They did with Sapphire Rapids technically by the end of it. But like... Uh Granite Rapids uses like uh what did we call it Redwood Cove Plus it uses a plus version of what's in Meteor Lake so this is this is something that's I guess a little better than Zen 4 but it's not I don't think it's going to tie Zen 5 in per core performance uh they say the people no. I talk to at Intel think it will but so I guess this is my point though right AMD is going to have a 128 core early next year then Intel is going to launch a 120 core that's weaker and then AMD is going to launch a 192, 384 thread big core product. And then there's 288 core, no hyper threading, like Comet Lake performance per core, Sierra Forest. I don't see who wants these when AMD's already launched better versions of it first. And if you want to go cheaper, well, yeah, you go to ARM CPUs, right? You've already brought sure. it up. like, And yeah, that's why I yeah, think yeah, AMD yeah. doesn't have to worry about those yet. They will eventually. However, but, don't don't you think that if, if the next uh, P core Intel server hardware is it, the P cores from Meteor Lake, then the question is going to be what performance at what power? Mm-hmm. Because at the moment, not good, really not good. And they they have to... I think they want to double it. So whatever they have now with Sapphire Rapids, double that, basically. Uh, performance at same power. And AMD is going from 96 to 128 cores. That'll probably give you, with Zen 5, you know, at least a 50% or more boost right there. And I'm, Sapphire I'm Rapids concerned. is already behind, so. I'm concerned with AMD that they seem happy to, uh, so w- with the new Threadripper, they went up, mm. um, I mean, obviously it's announced at the minute we haven't got our hands on hardware, but those parts went from Zen 3 to Zen 4, 280 watts to 350 watts TDP. I, I'm slightly concerned that AMD, having done wonderful things with power draw and uh, efficiency, and basically has, has just sent a message to Intel, which it matters. I'm, I'm slightly concerned that they're moving in the wrong direction. I don't like that. But if Intel, with the next data mm-hmm. center stuff, is going to base it on Meteor Lake, and if they can make well, it much more efficient, kind I of think Meteor Lake. But yeah, sure. But 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 uh, and the thing is that we've seen it, the the final feeds and speeds. You know the, the the triangle of cooling power and clock speed, and and obviously therefore what workload it can deliver. Uh, until you get your mitts on it, you just don't blimmin know. But Alder Lake to Raptor Lake, they didn't change anything, mm-hmm. and yet. It went a hell of a sight faster now. Apparently, that's down to the, the you know turning on the voltage regulation that previously hadn't worked or some such. But uh, again, you, you look the guys in the eye and you say, "What have you changed?" And they say, "Ah, oh, we improved a few things." And it's like, huh? What? Just a few, though. <laughs> uh, well, precisely. But but the fact is that Alder Lake performed fine, and Raptor Lake is just blooming faster. Um. Mm-hmm. So. What you see in the spec and the block diagram and the details doesn't mean a damn thing till you get your hands on it. It's all, as you say, it's all just words. Show me the money, because well, that's just what it is. Yeah, but I guess you know I am curious what you you know leading into like Zen Five and like mm. because you know like Zen Four Threadripper. I'm going to be honest, like. I I actually before we started recording looked it up like what what did I say a year ago and it's funny a year ago apparently by the way almost to the day <laughs> I had a video that said Zen 4 Threadripper or yeah Zen 4 Threadripper should come out end of 2023 but maybe slip to next year and we're seeing it come out right after Thanksgiving it's like barely happening but if I'm being honest 
a month ago, I thought it was going to slip to next year because nothing's yeah. happening. They don't seem worried. From what I hear, the fact that Intel is preparing a Sapphire Rapids refresh that is based on Emerald Rapids and Raptor like refresh kind of enhancements, mm. like, and the fact that AMD's seen some good sales supposedly at Dell and other OEMs of Fishhawk Falls from Intel is making AMD realize, hey, we can't keep neglecting Threadripper for this long. So I'm excited I, to see it happening. But if you ask me, it's really not launching until January. Yeah, I mean, I'm I, no, no I agree. So to, to me, it feels like it's, um, because AMD is, is a small company and the number of, I forget the headcount they have, but their headcount compared to Intel is just trivial. And the thing that Intel, said for years was uh we have more engineers in our software team than amd has total and then the snag well they should have worked a little harder on alchemist then if that's true (laughs) precisely precisely and and then when they when they then produce terrible terrible graphics drivers you go well that's not done you such a great favor has it so they stopped talking about that quite so much but the thing is that um amd essentially it's it's like one of those circus guys who goes around spinning plates on sticks they have to kind of keep giving different plates mm-hmm. a spin to keep them going. So they're going to bring in a new thing, but they've just got to give high-end desktop a quick flick just to keep it going. Because, I mean, how much work has gone into um, Zen 4 Threadripper? I mean, To be honest, more than I expected. <laughs> like, not a lot, but I was expecting the laziest, just here's Genoa with another name. In fact, if you look at what they're using... It's clearly based on the Sienna SP6 socket. Like it's smaller, mm. and then they've pa- than Genoa, and then they've packed more cores into it with less memory channels. I think so. I think there was more thought put into it than I certainly. I have to admit than I expected them to put into it, and then I ever heard they would. So, I, but again, it's coming out at the end of the year. So I think this is kind of a last minute. They're taking it seriously situation. Mm. Um, and by the way, just as a side note, this is a video I just didn't have time to do yet. Like. But that also tells me if they can fit 96 cores in something smaller than Genoa, then Genoa's entire socket is built for something way bigger next year. <laughs> like, yes. that's but obvious. The, but, then, but, but, the, but then when you see the sockets for the upcoming Intel stuff, I mean, those mm-hmm. things are just huge. Serve the Home did a thing just recently. Yeah, it's the they're biggest thing ahead. you've seen in your biggest thing in your entire damn life. But I do wonder about the, the, the size of these larger dies and larger sockets. There's a part of me that wonders if they don't actually find that to be slightly desirable. Because going back to that Sapphire Rapids 56 core, huge amount of power, cool as anything, because the density was so low. Now, we, we all know that silicon costs per square millimeter, but it does also remove a problem. And there's that thing about if you have dark silicon between areas, it actually helps cooling a lot, um, you know, to a huge extent. So you wonder... And you wonder, are they making a design and then later they'll shrink it to a different node and just mm-hmm. plug it in and move on? Because after all, that's almost the entire thing they're doing. Um, th- th- there are a huge number of moving parts. And yet, I think AMD's probably working significantly on an MI300 um, because that is uh, a big deal to them. Um, so yeah, they want some of that sweet, sweet money that Nvidia is getting. If only um, they had it six months sooner. <laughs> precisely, but but so often, isn't it? It's the right thing at the wrong time. Well, tough. Um, and then you've got. Uh, well, I think what the other thing was. Um, it's gone. But but the the ninety six core Threadripper um, strikes me as it's like a party trick. I mean, they'll, mm. they'll take your ten grand for it, and why not? But it, and then, and then, I think one of your notes to me said, um, one of your um, audience said, basically, how the hell do you test such a thing? It's like, well, sure. I mean, you're on Blender, great. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, the, Hardware and Box, I liked his uh, Zen Three Threadripper Pro review because he actually showed how they used it, and I forgot what the term was, but he basically will take like 10 different videos at once, and I think it was like stabilize them across all the cores, and he's like, this used to take us a day, and now it takes us an hour. <laughs> and I, I liked well, that I, review because he actually came up with something to use it for. The Intel feature that's in their laptop graphics called QuickSync, it was mm-hmm. something they talked about, because for years our shorthand for Intel integrated graphics was their trash. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that's just it. That Yes, you've got them. I don't care. And they said, no, 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 they're really good. They do things. It's like, I've seen no evidence of this. And then 
one time I was editing a video at CS or Computex on some tiddly little laptop, and it output the video faster than the runtime of the video. It was going past 100, and it was like, I thought, oh, God, I've done it at 720p or something terrible. And I checked, and the video was fine. And they'd enable QuitSync. And um, suddenly my laptop was a video editing monster. Well, and no, but that's the, the funny we- thing, too, is that's half of the reason I do use an NVIDIA graphics card for editing. It's not to say that there aren't apps that work well with AMD, but what I can say <laughs> is the ones I use tend to be optimized for nvidia and it just it is what it is right like and therefore if, the user experience and right and, and it's a tool and it does a thing so if suddenly your tiddly little laptop can suddenly punch through you know because as we in video graphics for editing it tends to be uh transitions and such like the graphics handle them really well the parallelism but when you're just doing here's the video on the timeline chop out some bits and pieces sort out the audio output the thing it finished thing job done and sometimes your laptop can flog away and in this case it was just zip and it was like huh intel igp for the win who thought who'd have thought that uh and and it just transformed my experience and that's nothing to do with core counts or clock speeds or anything it's down to the software well that's the question suddenly, though is you know phoenix got an ai engine before meteor like actually and strix mm. will have an updated media uh an updated AI engine, although I don't think Strix is the one where they're going hog. It's like it's a lot better than Phoenix's AI engine, but I don't think they're like really making it ten times better or anything. But I think the question then becomes though, is AMD now laying the groundwork to finally have developers use their stuff early so they can start having some of those advantages? Because I'd be curious God, if you've messed with it recently. Good. Wouldn't that be good? Because the thing is that for my entire life, uh Windows and Intel, it's Wintel, you know, the, the amount of Windows that was apparently written by Intel such that you just put it on an Intel system and it just works and it works well. Whereas AMD have to load up, and in the past, other other chip manufacturers like Cyrix and whoever else. But uh, it just worked, and that, that was worth so much both to the user but also to the system integrators and to the OEMs. If AMD can get some of that, that would that be a huge help. Um, they deserve it. I mean, they've proven that they can do it now, I think. This piece of content is brought to you by the Minis Forum HX77G. It includes an unhindered version of the 7735HS and 6600M, meaning that the APU boosts to 54 watts and the 6600M boosts past 2.4 gigahertz, basically giving you a desktop ARC 6600 that uses less energy. And you can also equip it with up to 64 gigabytes of DDR5 and terabytes of Gen 4 PCIe storage. And I'm gonna be honest, actually, This thing impressed me. My girlfriend has been using a smaller APU-only Minis forum system since spring this year. And once again this year, I surprised her with an early Christmas present that wasn't that much bigger than her old little PC. But yeah, that 6600M, it boosted its performance over the Rembrandt APU more than I expected it to. And honestly, this Navi 23 GPU had no issues running Hogwarts Legacy at almost all ultra settings locked at 60 frames at her full resolution, which is 2520 by 1680. It's running locked 60 above 1440p Ultra Hogwarts. This thing can do it. And even Metro Exodus worked fine. I could get it running above 1440p again at high settings. That's a fully ray traced game. Uh, No, you're not going to be doing 4K 120 uh, unless it's an older game, nor will you easily be doing 1440p 240. But 1080p was a complete joke with this little system, even at 144 hertz. And at the native resolution of 1680p, 60 hertz wasn't an issue with almost all games running at maxed out settings. And this thing was actually whisper quiet as well, consuming less energy than a PS5 while not making almost any noise. And look, if you wanted more RAM or storage, it's easy to open up and add it yourself. And it comes at a pretty attractive price. Support Moore's Law is Dead by clicking on that link below. Just clicking on the link below to the Minis Forum website to look at the product helps this channel a ton. But if you do want it, get it through that link and make sure they know that I sent you. I'd appreciate it. And I think a lot of people would appreciate this project. I legitimately mean it. It impressed me. Check out the Minis Forum HX77G today. 
Sapphire Rapids refresh, my understanding is they're just taking the dyes they've been selling, the ones that you said use too much power. And from what I've heard, yeah. they're going to be 5 to 15% faster and use 5 to 15% lower power, which I think is important because right. it's, we'll see if this happens, but the suggestion is, is that they will be faster and they will kind of that amperage and power supply requirements will be a little more reasonable. Do you think that's really enough to make up for competing with Threadripper this time around? Number one. Number two, do you think Zen 4 Threadripper is good enough that just AMD's back on top in HEDT for the time being? Or do you think because they've neglected it so long, they really are going to have to pay more attention to it for the next two years and make up for lost time? I've got no idea what the, the, the volume of the market is for high-end desktop. Mm-hmm. Bearing in mind, Intel kind of invented it, um, and they brought out originally a six core, and all you could get on the desktop was four core. Uh, and the reason you're going to get four core was because that's what they decided to sell us. So it was an entirely artificial market that was sub workstation. So if you wanted really serious stuff, you bought workstation. And as we know, high end desktop was low end Xeon. Um, then Threadripper came along. You had James Pryor on some few months back, that, mm-hmm. who uh, James was one of my amd reps i mean he's a brit but he's in america and he was the thread ripper guy um so i'm sure james would like hello james would like to hear himself referred to as the godfather of thread ripper um but he said it was a skunk works thing and essentially it was mm-hmm. taking this part which is from servers and stick it in a desktop and, and wallop and that really did seem to me to be pretty much all it was and it was revolutionary because sorry how many calls you know, you couldn't get anything like it, and it was a good number of cores, and it was a legitimate product. Threadripper 2000 was a funny beast, and then the, the current Threadripper is good, but it seems to me that it serves most of the market. Now, I think moving on to, because uh, the DJR5 with the new Threadripper is that's registered or ECC, so that's got to be special, so that's going to be tricky. Um, but it's obviously going to have better PCI Express support and so on and so forth. So to me, the fact you can go to the pro version and go 96 core, I couldn't care less. I really couldn't. Mm. And I doubt many people will. And that's meant to be 10 grand for the bare processor, I think. And then the 64 core, 5 grand. Technically, they haven't even announced the price of the pro no. ones, only the non-pro. No, but but we, we, we've heard, haven't we? Um, but so I, I cannot think that that's a, a mass market part mm-hmm. um and so some people will buy it because somebody always does but uh, but i would have thought that that was up against the really high-end oh. imac pros almost um mm-hmm. yeah you know, the really high-end apple stuff you know i i, I think it's fighting i mean it, it kind of almost games. doesn't have equal i mean but it's char mm-hmm. they're charging yeah. so much for it that they know it doesn't yeah. right yeah, quite. You're in you're in the realms of you know. Do you, are you prepared to pay six hundred dollars for the wheels for your workstation to wheel it around the office? It's it's, mm-hmm. it's that market. It's a it's a whole different game. So the the the, the super deal behind part is like a benchmark winner, isn't it? And that that's pretty much all it is. Uh, it seems to me it's all the other parts of the package: the faster memory, the better ssd support the insane the blah, amount blah, blah. of pcie 5.0 is yeah. crazy yeah to, to me that's what it's really going to be about and you have to assume the motherboard manufacturers i don't know how many um models there will be that support the new processors but you've got to think they're going to be some monumental pieces of work because it requires it and the ticket price will be high because if you're going up to five grand for the 64 core um fine see your motherboards i don't know pick a figure two and a half grand or whatever that's Mm -hmm. that'll that'll buy you any motherboard in the world um so it's going to get the development guys working on it it's going to be it's going to be like a a kingpin evga product i would imagine it's not do you think like anyone's going to pay attention to sapphire rapids refresh with this in the market because it kind of seems like my opinion, by the way, of a, mo- a month ago was if Intel can get their Emerald Rapids version, you know, of HEDT out a few months before Zen 4 Threadripper, there's really an opening here. And my argument, out, by the way, was hmm. I don't think most people need 96 cores. I think if Intel just makes the power consumption reasonable, makes it 10% better, 
I don't think anyone's waiting for Zen 4 Threadripper. I think they're just going to buy this. But now AMD's rushing this out to kind of kneecap that launch, I think. And well, when, um, when Intel killed, it's Rialto Bridge they killed, wasn't it? So Ponte Vecchio has happened. Rialto yeah, that Bridge was one, one of them, yeah. died. I, I, I kind of thought it made, um, it, it was just neat. It, it would be neat when you lopped off the branch for Rialto Bridge to lop off the branch for whatever came after Sapphire Rapids. That, mm-hmm. that probably doesn't make any sense. Just in my mind, it did because they were the next things in that line. I think because they're allied in a, in the Aurora supercomputer. So I probably thought, well, if you're killing the one, kill the both. Um, because it just seemed to me to need a bigger step change than 10% or 15%. You know, I want 50% less power. Yeah. And that's going to take a lot more than that. And if you achieve the 50% less power, by halving the speed, that's no good either. You know, it's, it's got to be a proper change. Well, so it sounds like, so, yeah, you think with Zen 4 Red Ripper, I mean, it's done. AMD's taking the market yeah, back then. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the, 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 the last Red Ripper came out when Intel, oh God, they had the, what they had there, the 9,000 series of high end desktop, and then they brought out a 10,000, which was the precise same part, but half the prices, because they'd let prices go up to creep up to 2,000, which was beyond insane. So they brought out some new parts that were identical apart from the pricing. And it came out on the same day from memory as Threadripper. And it was like, mm-hmm. big God, why, why, why? To, to zero to almost no sampling and fanfare. They kind of well, didn't want people to talk about it. A- absolutely. If, if you want, if you want to make a thing, just go away. That's the way to do it. So, um, yeah, if, if they announce Emerald Rapids on Christmas day or, or the 4th you know, of July whatever. or whatever, then, then that would kind of be the thing. It's, um, I th- yeah, yeah, I think almost the date it happens will be significant because if it's a public holiday, but like, okay, you're telling us the tale here, aren't you? Um, now, we don't do care. you think, don't though, care. that AMD is going to feel pressure to re- get a Zen 5 Threadripper out at the end of next year? Because that's my question. Because what I always heard is... Ooh. That might not come out until 2025, but maybe AMD's learned their lesson a little bit here. Like if they neglect this market too long, Intel will launch something and it will cause some trouble. And it would be interesting if one year after Mm -hmm. Zen 4 Threadripper, they had Zen 5, because then they'd be getting a little bit back to their old cadence of kind of launching it after. Yeah, but the cadence has has slipped, I think, for most things to 18 months, which is why I was saying about the next desktop parts potentially being Easter, because that would be 18 months away from the last. Um, uh, And I don't think that the the, the cadence, apart from obviously development, is uh, should be purely down to the market. But I think Mm -hmm. with with AMD, I think it's also down to essentially they can do a big thing each quarter. And once they've done a server thing, they can do a desktop thing and they can do a graphics thing and they can do a thing and not that their graphics things are big things. And I think they realize that too, right? If they launch Zen 4 Threadripper next to Raptor like Refresh, it makes Intel look silly. You know, I think that's kind of part of it as well. And then, yeah, so that's my question though, is if you think they'll go like AM5 Zen 5, Server Zen 5, uh, Server Dense Zen 5, then Threadripper, or do you think they'll neglect it for two years like they did now because i'm hoping at least amd gets back to launching the threadripper non-pro variant every year or so yes it's not at the same time as ryzen but maybe it's half a year to a year after not two or three years or never coming out i don't think the cadence is dictated by mapping out what would be a nice thing to do i think that no i know that's that's the question then right yeah i think their absolutely primary focus is money because to the because it's just it is just essential um so everything which is a bit like their graphics pricing we say you know if you priced your such and such at so and so then you could sell so many units and i think and they look around they go well nvidia is charging this much so yeah we want to make that sweet sweet margin and therefore our volume's way lower, so boom, we're selling it for, and you go, oh, that's a shame. And it's like, yeah, what you want and what we want are two very different things. Um, And I think that feeds into everything. I think it feeds into cadence. Uh, Jensen is a There should be a Granite Rapids one, though. There should be a Granite Rapids HEDT Ah. in a year-ish from, well, let's call it a year and a change from now. So the question becomes, is that going to be any good? And will AMD want to launch a quarter before that? 
Okay. If 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 Granite Rapids on high on desktop is going to be a thing, then I think AMD would either have to beat it, as you say, because uh, otherwise they're taking a loss, unless they've got something else which is more important. Mm-hmm. Something that's more important to them than than I think it'll stick to. The thing is, Jensen, and that's why I don't think it would happen in the first half of the year because there's no way they're letting it go before you know Epic. So but Gen- on, if, sorry. if Jensen's a savant, it strikes me that Lisa Sue is um, Lisa Sue strikes me that she has had incredibly good timing. Um, mm. I I don't think I mean she's clearly a, a, an incredibly successful woman, but. Uh, she hasn't let them muck things up, but I don't see any uh, flash of genius. Mm. I don't. Uh, but so, for example, the pricing stuff, it's like, how can we make money? Well, we can charge more as much as we possibly can, and we'll get some cash because what's the point of giving it away? Very logical decisions. And. Uh, and she's kind of taken a leaf out of the apple thing of um you know the and here's something else so uh you know we'll go oh great we're not just going to do um an eight core 3d desktop processor we've got a 16 core 3d processor and and we'll go wild and it's like it's very nice too or but it wasn't actually but it uh, but it, it makes everyone happy so lisa stand there holding up yet another thing and 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 we're all pleased um and and yet, I think there's been an element of um, AMD got very lucky because Intel was in such a doldrum when they brought out Ryzen. But they have delivered lots of good things. And I suspect behind the scene, Lisa Sue is busy telling people, no, that's a stinker. That one does not see the light of day. We bury that one. I think there's a lot of that going on. Okay. So you mentioned, though, that uh, Lisa Sue looks at something and goes, well, that's going to be a stinker. We don't need to worry. And I think... The fact that Zen 3 Threadripper, well, never came out, frankly, outside mm. of Pro is a perfect example of that. Yes. You know, looking forward, though, I was pretty hyped up for Meteor Lake for a while there. And like a lot of recent Intel products, frankly, it was supposed to come out, what, you know, early ne- le- this year and then mid this mm. year. And then I thought, well, if they can just get it out for back to school, I think this is a big deal. You know, Meteor Lake uses the same platform as Arrow Lake. It's a huge sea change in efficiency for Intel. So this should hopefully be where laptop manufacturers sit around and go, well, we've got to do this. We've got to make good Meteor Lake laptops because it's going to be a big deal. It's going to be ready for back to school and Arrow Lake's going to drop right into it so we can just have upgrades come out next year. It'll be perfect. And also Arrow Lake's supposed to be very high performance. So we're going to want that ready ahead of time. And what we've seen happen is Meteor Lake's launching December 14th, which is a really odd situation. And, you know, uh, Wendell from Level 1 Techs was recently on, and he said something to a, with a lot more detail, something I've heard, but he really expanded on quite a bit, which is that all of these Phoenix laptops are all of a sudden popping up from all these manufacturers out of nowhere. And he seemed to think that it was because they were going to have Meteor Lake refreshes. They designed for them. And then they're not ready. And now they're like, AMD, get us something. And my brother just got one. And it wasn't, there was no announcement. It was coming out just out of nowhere. Lenovo had a Phoenix version. And I was like, oh, this looks cool. And so I can't help but wonder if AMD, or should I say if Intel left the door open here. Again, I don't think, you know, again, Arrow Lake's going to use the same platform. Um, So OEMs are going to have to design for Meteor Lake to support the future. But I feel like if it would have been out for back to school, Intel could have maybe rushed in the door with the next gen product and closed it behind them. And now they're they're basically going to launch it at the same time as Zen 5 APUs. And I'm curious if you think Meteor Lake will really be good enough because I put out, you know, benchmarks and so have like a dozen other people of Meteor Lake benchmarks that basically show it's the same performance as Raptor Lake, but it's at least 30% more efficient. Is that going to be enough against AMD, who's increasing core counts by 50%? Okay. And the, the, Again, the performance thing, you see, if if they match the current, because we, we're also expecting, God help us, to have um, Raptor Lake refresh uh, mobile for, desk, mm-hmm. uh, for, for laptops, which is like whoopity do. Now that you know, that tells you a lot about Meteor Lake that they think they still need that in laptop. 
Well, I think it tells us, sadly, uh, an awful lot about the expectations of the market. Um, I was told some few years ago, I mean, within living memory, um, because I, I made a, a, a point, I was looking at a bunch of laptops, and it's like, for the love of God, are you really saying even the new Intel graphics are so terrible that you have to have NVIDIA graphics? And um, they said, no, no, the reason we have to put so uh, NVIDIA at the time was on MX300 or MX400. Mm -hmm. Then they went to 600. Then they went to the, you know, the, the, the four-digit ones. And they're saying, no, we can't sell a laptop if it doesn't have NVIDIA on the box. The public won't buy them. I've heard so similar things if, recently about ARC, by the way. They don't want to put an ARC sticker on the Media right, Lake laptops. Right. E exactly the same thing. So there's what the public expect. So I think you're going to get a thing going on where a bunch of the public are going to say we want the grunty performance. I think Intel is going to be uh, – this move to AI and, and, and things done by AI, partly it's the way of the world. You know, your phone does it. The photo editing is done at least in part by AI. Um, and that's in the first instance what Intel's talking about. But there's also this feature in Windows. Is it, It's Copilot, isn't it? Um, your That's coming out system. later this year, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, well, the, the the update to Windows that happened very recently, you can turn on, um, I think, a beta of Copilot. But the, uh, the idea, the logic of it is that if you have a personal assistant, so you, if you talk to, uh, and I don't dare say the words because everything will start responding, but any of those, you know, hey, and then the name of those software products, and it's pops like, how can I help you? And you mm -hmm. say, book me a flight to wherever the heck, and can you check my bank balance and see what I've got going on? And by the way, call the doctor and ask for the ointment for my rash. Um, and all this is bouncing to the cloud and all the rest of it. And you don't want your business all over the world. So what they're desperate to do is to have the personal digital assistant on your device that has the intelligence to handle all your information and your requests and to offer you suggestions, which presumably lead to your buying stuff. And that's the idea. So it's this moving. Um, so with, with AI, we've got uh, training and we've got inference. And then the next stage, so obviously the training is monumental numbers of GPUs and then inference is a different game. And then, as um, Jensen's told us, then you have down at the edge, you have the, om was it the Omniverse or whatever that word was? You know, yeah. so your BMW plants, they have all this stuff going on. We have a digital twin of the factions. And that doesn't, that's not our world at all. And then you come down to the edge and then you come down to the device. And that's where at the moment it's your phone. And I'm certain that Meteor Lake, they're desperate for the AI, AI part of the SOC, just as with that Qualcomm thing you're looking at earlier, compete with that. And that's what it's meant to do. So it's a user experience thing. I don't know what the name of it will be unless they're literally mm -hmm. supporting Copilot in Windows, and it might well be that. Or it doesn't have an Intel name. It's just Intel AI doing this thing, in which case they'll be head-to-head -head with Qualcomm because Qualcomm, if they're running Windows, will be doing exactly the same thing. Now, whether you have to have your identity locked to your Intel device and whether you can move it to a different mm -hmm. device or not, don't know. Um, but that's the kind of line they're going down. So you've got uh, Raptor Lake refresh on laptop will be X cores, or X speed, and whatever. And that doesn't um, have a neural engine, though. Raptor Lake refresh. Right, right. So it's down to frame rate and gaming. But that, that's your, that's the gaming laptops that Tim from Hardware Unboxed has got sick and tired of. Whereas the the Meteor Lake is, I think, going to be more akin to a mobile phone, but with a proper screen and a keyboard, but obviously don't go in your pocket. I think mm -hmm. it's more that is the direction they're going in. So the, the market is forking. It's not not by form factor, although I think there'd be an element of that, I think by user experience. I think those are the words you're going to be hearing a lot of in coming time, which is going to be a swine for us, because how the hell do you benchmark AI? Well, I've got two things to say to that, though, because it's something that's come up on a lot of consulting calls I've been in is they'll say, well, how big of a deal do you think AI is in Phoenix? They just keep talking about it. How big of a deal yeah. do you think AI will be in Meteor Lake? They keep talking about it. And, you know, a lot of these investor types will ask, well, is it doesn't seem like any apps use it. Like, is this a waste of silicon? And I tell them it's it's not even I don't even think it's using 10 percent of the silicon guys. It's using like nothing like they're adding a tiny neural engine onto this chip 
instead of adding one more e core. And if you ask me, it's much more useful to add one neural, like a neural engine that can do all these other things than it is to go from 10 to 11 cores or something. Because who needs 11 cores when you can have neural engines doing some things a thousand times faster? But then I also tell them, yeah, they're talking about AI because they have to. That's the new hype word. Mm, and I'm wondering, yes. and it's not to say all AI will be hype. It is to say, though, if you're marketing meteor lake for its ai functions this is not h100 guys so like no 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 I'm i wonder what not. you think yeah. about that though like how much of it is overhyped and really not going to make a major difference in meteor like sales in the short term okay so so the the business about the type of ai and the fact the idea is it'll be on device therefore won't have to communicate with the outside world and therefore it means it's not dependent on communication and, and therefore obviously it also means the speed of it should be instantaneous because it's on device long term total believer that'll be a big thing long term mm -hmm. yeah uh, but the suggestion is therefore that they want to do it now but in the uh Meteor Lake briefings in Malaysia, we had, I forget the guy's name, who was their AI chap. And he did a joint presentation with Tom Peterson, the former NVIDIA guy, who's now AMD uh, Intel Graphics. And it was uh, quite clear that, that there's a very significant tie-in between the graphics and the AI side of things, even though mm -hmm. there is an AI engine within the SOC, also the way it interacts, the graphics throughout Meteor Lake are in a number of areas, um, both as a pure graphics engine, but also connected to the AI, but also there's a, a display engine as a wholly separate thing. It's mm -hmm. quite bizarre what they've done, but they've clearly done it for good reason. The question is whether it functions. But what, uh, what I noticed was that, so just as the, uh, the graphics core has fixed function for different codecs, so H.264, H.265, AV1, plus others. Um, and therefore, they've, they've covered the bases. Therefore, obviously, they can do all this stuff with minimum power. Um, they've also got a bunch of similar stuff going on, and AI is way outside of my space, although it's going to have to be in my space. Um, they're doing similar things. At the minute, they're, they're just showing slide after slide of what of the say pattern it's not a pattern um it's, it's the, the different ai schemes how mm -hmm. different software because if uh, the the current betas of a um adobe photoshop and adobe premiere uh use different ai things so you can do that generative fill for photos and such like take out thing or you can expand your photo you can make it bigger and it will generatively fill what isn't doesn't exist it will just make your photo larger by adding significant things to it, it looks right and they do quite a good job with it. Um, but how they do that, which part of which AI software they use to do that, they've got mm -hmm. options. So Intel essentially has to cover the damn lot. And so they, they're just throwing everything at it. And so the functions built into Meteor Lake on the AI front is like, we don't know what they're going to use. They could use any one of these. We put the damn lot in there. Mm -hmm. How well they work, who knows? Um, but presumably they want to, to not exclude any software company. Any software company says, well, we do it this way. So we've got it covered. Go, do it. Whereas I never heard any such words from AMD. All they mm. said was, we do AI. I was like, okay, what's that mean? Like, well, we do kind of power management fan curve. Like, great. Th this was orders of magnitude different. It might, but it do you think it'll make yeah. a difference short term? Because that's my question, right? Like, if Copilot what... makes a difference, then yes. If Copilot is anything to anybody, yes. If not in the first instance, I'd say not. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then you're going to get like, like with me being blown away by um, QuickSync, suddenly you're making my videos output ludicrously fast. Yeah, you know, mm -hmm. so great. So if you use Photoshop and you use whichever beta, and then which will become non-beta that uses generative fill with AI or whatever it might, you know, something like that, something specific, then sure, nice. But uh, I, with, with AMD and with some gigabyte stuff from a few years ago when they were talking, they had said they had AI to do with switching modes for gaming or something. It was just nonsense. I was totally unimpressed. With this, I'm still skeptical. Mm. 
but it, it it could be a thing. I'm I'm much more interested in it than Raptor Lake Refresh Mobile. Well, much. I more. mean, how can't you be? <laughs> right. And therefore, but that's that's the that's in my, in my mind. You see, at the minute, in the first instance, because as you say, so mid December, clearly at CES, which is um, mm-hmm. second week of January, Meteor Lake is going to be a thing. But it doesn't feel like it's going to be a big thing. It doesn't mm-hmm. feel like it's going to be lots of laptops there and lots of partners. It will. So that's a shame. Which goes back to I what you're saying. I think they missed. Up. They. I feel like they missed their opportunity. Yeah. And you know, you you talked about well, Raptor Lake refreshes for gaming and stuff. It's like well. But my understanding is Strix Point is going to be your standard 200 something millimeter squared APU, and it's going to have 12 cores and graphics as strong as a 3050. Doesn't that sound so, so good? I mean, that's uh, my uh, argument, uh, right? They're going to be yeah, as good yeah. as Raptor Lake Refresh in CPU and gaming while giving you a 3050 while having a better AI engine. This is launching at about the same time as Meteor Lake. I can't help but sit here and go, Meteor Lake was supposed to compete with Phoenix, and it probably would have been better. But if it so has if, to compete if, with this, if if you re- rewind a handful of years to before Intel put graphics into desktop processors, and uh, and obviously AMD has only done it very recently, back to when uh, it was only specific APUs that had it, and AMD had some and they were competent, and mm-hmm. I had a number of conversations, which was if they could do that, but less power that would be great because you end up with a desktop processor, a, a desktop motherboard rather, like obviously the socket was identical to the non-APU part. Uh, Raven Ridge would be the first one that really got me going. But the cooler on the thing has to handle like uh, 95 watts or 125 watts. And it's like, well, so I haven't got a graphics card, but I still have to have a case and a power supply and a big cooler. So I've gained something, but I've not gained everything. What I want Mm -hmm. is a tiny PC, an SFX power supply, and a a tiny little heatsink that can handle 65 watts or 45 watts, you know. Mm -hmm. And it was always a generation away from being the thing that really was going to be the thing. Um, And it's now starting to feel like it's never going to land. You know, the the goal posts keep moving. You get more performance, but it still takes more power, more power, more power. Uh, or not in, or not sufficiently little power to get a tiny form factor. That's that's really what I want. Well, I think it goes into you know what you mean by tiny form factor because Strix is going to use thirty five watts. That's I think really where it's going to excel. Thirty five, but will it boost beyond thirty five, or will thirty five be the limit? Oh, I'm sure it's going to be the same as now. If you want it to use fifty four, you can, but it's really meant. Yeah for the 28 to 40 area. Um, yeah. And then if you want bigger, they have an entirely different APU, Strix Halo, which is 16 cores, 40 compute units. I mean, this is a bona fide laptop mm. chip that doesn't require dedicated graphics. And I and I sit here and I just go, all of this neural engine stuff is cool, but I can't help but think both companies, they're just years away from it really being used. And meanwhile, AMD is going to have something out that does everything better in laptop right now. And by the way, Strix APUs drop into Phoenix, so they don't even need to update the laptop design. Which is it can just a good thing. Right in. I, I do find it quite funny as an aside. One of the things that we, actually the audience rather than us particularly, kicks Intel about is new platform every couple of years. Whereas mm-hmm. AMD, when they came up with AM4 and it's, how long did AM4 run for? I think five years does. is what you'd basically right, right. say. And, and that was, uh, caused them all sorts of problems, you know, with BIOS, fun enough for the APUs, you know, suddenly you couldn't, if you installed this BIOS version, you couldn't now install these processors. My brother was, had to do some trick to go from Zen plus to Zen three. Cause right. he had like a one eighty dollar motherboard and he had to like update this, then switch CPU, then update yeah. again. It was, troublesome but it worked out in the end but a, a chunk of that was probably partly um certainly with the with the APUs because uh, the lap the motherboard manufacturers had gone cheap and gone for a small bias mm-hmm. chip because because they didn't expect know, much out of amd either right right, right. exactly exactly which goes back to the thing about seeing development in real time you're seeing it actually how it really works when no one's chucking money at them um, so in a sense, AMD's virtue of sticking with AM4 and sticking with the platform, plus also if you had an original X370, was it? Um, 
the first value before 470, which got quite good. Would you really want to stick a newer processor in that piece of crap? You know, maybe not. I mean, the good ones were okay. The bad ones weren't good. Um, mm -hmm. So they stick with it. Whereas at Intel, Z690, Z790, and then Z790 refresh, so you don't need a new board. So it's supporting three years of desktop processors, and they've got no credit for that whatsoever. Because, yeah, well, three years. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly, because big bloody deal. Whereas the laptop thing, if the, if the chassis manufacturer can go, in it goes, and it just works. I mean, that that's that's gravy. That's, that's golden for them, particularly if the BIOS just works and if memory support works and SSD support works. And there's no funny business. AMD's got so much better at memory support. I mean, they, they've moved from a fairly stinky place, I think, to now pretty good. Um, I'm, I'm feeling so much warmer. but it takes so many years of experience to get it right. Mm -hmm. And and they're getting there. Uh, they've got there. They've got there. I'm going to say they've got there. With Zen 4, they've got there. King Harkinian writes in, and he says, AMD's been making strides on server and desktop PCs, but seems to struggle with laptops. Well, anytime someone says this, I actually have to butt in and go, well, they've gone from 0% market share to 30%. So it's not like bad everybody but he says they failed to deliver the expected volume to clients several times he says the laptop market is huge how impactful would a failure to capitalize on strict speed for them long term what can they do to better themselves in this area moving forward and i'm using this to kind of lead into my opinion here mm -hmm. strix will succeed if they make enough of them and actually deliver them like that's honestly what i think like and and i always have to play devil's advocate when people complain about amd not having enough laptops for sale it's because they keep selling out instantly and they keep taking market share every year it's a good problem to have but a problem they wish they didn't have when i look at they're going to launch uh hot point strix point fire range strix halo and i think maybe one other one next year this is way more apus than i've ever seen amd launch in one year when this is all about will they make enough they, they, well, right. They announced a bunch of products at CES still this year, so 2023. And the, the list of it was basically mixing and matching features, mm -hmm. such that I'm quite sure at least one of the parts was a Rembrandt. Yeah, Zen 2. It was like. Oh, yeah, no. Then they had Mendocino. Well, Mendocino was a new part, but they used Zen 2 still because Zen 2 yeah. doesn't take up a lot of space. <laughs> Right, but, but so presumably that's for some. Sp you, you would imagine some customers demanded it. I mean, the the idea that just kind of produce this thing on the off chance someone might want it didn't make a lot of sense. So presumably, they um, it's for they Chromebooks a, and stuff. Yeah, right. Uh, uh, and but the idea you look down that product stack, given that each of those parts is it's not like a um, renamed thing or they're fused off a bit. I mean, th there were a bunch of unique parts there, as far as I could determine which means that someone at some point has to say, right, these are the wafer starts that we book with TSMC on these different nodes. Mm. This is what we're going to do. Okay, you, which wafers are we running for which of these things for laptops, which in turn means they have to determine uh, three, six months ahead, how many of each of these things, unless they've got firm orders from insert name of ODM or mm. whoever here, well, then how do they know <laughs> so and i think amd going back to my thing is so driven by they need to make money the idea of just making a bunch of stuff and having it in stock on the off chance someone buys it they can't they have mm -hmm. to have customers lined up which is why i think for them the consoles have been such great stuff that i shouldn't think the margins are great on the console stuff but it's bulk isn't it it and, seems a little better than expected but no it can't be as good as right. like other so, places and and think back to you know the horrors of 2020 when demand went through the roof for everything. Could you buy a console in 2020? No. Could you buy one in 2021? Eh, kinda. And the demand was essentially infinite. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that was the thing. You can't just conjure these things out of thin air. Can't be done. So I think the thing about demand, I, I would say that the the balance of supply and demand is finely balanced. And I think AMD will always want to be sold out and keep mm -hmm. people waiting rather than have anything sitting on the shelves. That, that's the way it seems to me. Mm -hmm. um, and that must surely be even more true when they have to have things like 3D cache packaging done because 
those parts are who owns them? Someone said about this recently. So TSMC puts the yeah they they have the their own line be, for it there yeah yeah the, but the wafers can be um, put through the fabs and they're almost complete and then they're complete and that that's on TSMC's uh, inventory and then they get in the 3D cash they rather make the 3D cash separate and then they package it. I don't think it becomes AMD's property until it's finished. Mm -hmm. So. And, the, and that process takes longer. Um, and I don't think TSMC is going to want to commit to holding inventory for AMD unless they absolutely have to. So I think you've got a bit of a, a tussle going on with that as well. So I think AMD starts with who's our guaranteed customers for this stuff and have you got a signed order mm -hmm. at a decent price? You know, you ain't giving our stuff away. And then, and then I think they work back from there, which is right, spin up the fabs, get those wafers going. Um, and if they got an order for a Zen 2 part, hell, they'll make Zen 2. Yeah. I'm just trying to think what they would have probably been planning ahead two years ago. Because, well, you know, in 2020, that, that would have been when they made these plans. <laughs> all evidence is, is all these companies bought up as much capacity as possible. And I kind of hear that AMD is like, eh, we don't need as many graphics. The question then becomes, though, okay, well, they tempered graphics orders for 2024. Did they for laptop? Because... Again, you know, if they didn't, I think this is the time where they have this opening before Intel really comes back hard. Agreed. But I, I, th I think they were probably cautious because any any false, and I think that is, I think that is Lisa Sue's role is to be cautious because any big snafu mm -hmm. could finish them. Um, I mean, by all accounts, uh, Nvidia is double booked with TSMC for just everything, every mm -hmm. single scrap of stuff, um, because the, their margins are so monumental. I mean, they're 70%, aren't they, on their um, top-end graphics? That yeah. If it means that they literally run stuff through and then park it, doesn't matter to them. It means they've got the option of calling it off, finishing it up, whatever it might be, because they've got so many other considerations, um, HBM on the high-end stuff, uh, all the power regulation hardware, all the all the memory that goes on the GPU. There's so much other stuff that comes into the equation. Of course, they control the lot, as we know. They keep total control of it, um, as EVGA well, I, found. I kind of like to get on that note, though, because oh. one thing that I've heard is uh, NVIDIA, despite being happy that they're getting a ton of sales in AI right now, does realize that they probably misjudged their Lovelace pricing, at least with the 4080, quite a bit. And I'm curious if you have any thoughts on, and I think there's an interesting way to ask this question. Like, I remember I told Dan to this after I put out my uh, Super Leak, like where I basically outlined the three cards they're going to launch. Mm. And I told him, <clears throat> from what it sounds like, the 4080 Super, it is going to use the fastest 24 gigabit per second memory. It's almost certainly going to use the full die. And they're probably going to push it to a higher wattage because they can. I mean, it uses the 4090 cooler. They probably mm. clocked it too low from the start. So I think they could launch something 10 to 15% better. And it's not decided. You know, frankly, these things really aren't decided until a week before they announce it. But they are considering launching this thing better than their current one for $1,000 instead of 1200 which means, well, if you think about it, that's like a 10% performance boost to 20% price cut. That's a 30% price to performance increase, at least on this card that, to be fair, nobody's buying. But mm. I'm curious if you think that's enough to make a big difference. We can talk about the other super ones if you want, but there's a part of me that goes, because I saw this in the comments section for my video, they're like, still not enough. I almost wonder if there's a psychological thing going on here that NVIDIA is going to run into a little bit, which is you're not going to get people to, you're not going to get a lot of people to pay $1,000 for an 80. When they see 80, they think seven to 900. They do not think 1,000. Um, to be fair, I think the 4070 Super will basically be that. But then will people say, I don't want a 4070 for $900 or 800 though, you know? So I, I'm curious you, if you think that's enough. Oh, after you um, talked about the Supers and I was reading news about supply of 4090s potential going to the PRC for the next few months, which obviously would have ramifications. I looked up, so this would be in this past week, current prices of 4090s at overclockers.co.uk. And I think 
£1,600, including VAT mm. here in the UK. And then that um, the ASUS that has the AIO liquid cooler on it, I think 2500 that one's pretty overpriced in every region, though. That agreed, model, but yeah, agreed. But it but it gives you a range of parts that have forty ninety in the name, um, mm-hmm. which is obviously apart from that, it's a huge range. But it starts at a price that I think is just like crazy high. But when I did check one of those uh, pricing trends, it's not that it suddenly stepped up. It's kind of been there for a while. So that is the level, sadly. And I think this thing with the forty eighty comes under the heading of. I, when I started doing 4K video work, I bought two 980 graphics cards because I needed you know, the correct HDMI or display port or whatever the heck it was, a certain number of things. So it's kind of etched in my mind that those are £600 a piece. Mm-hmm. And that's therefore that long ago. And I, I truly think NVIDIA's done this thing. They've ramped up the price just as iPhones have gone up. You know, $999, well, go for it. And then it goes up and it goes up. I don't think it's in Jensen's DNA to go down. I just don't think he's going to do it. So I think he's relying on time to say to people, you've forgotten that in the past things used to be this, that 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 that, that, that time, forget it. It's long gone. Even if you think you remember it, you don't remember it. It's, it's, you've got a false memory. Prices are now this. There's this, there's this, there's this, there's this. And I'm sure they would say we've got something at every price point, albeit the base price. Back in my day, you could get entry-level graphics card at £100. Pounds. Mm-hmm. You know, clearly now, what do what you now say is your you know, entry-level 300 I mean... I would say entry level is, well, again, let's be clear. There's a difference in my mind between entry and low end. I would say entry is now 150 whereas before I'd say $80. I mean, the HD well, 6670, I mean, that was fine for... It was, it seven, was a thing that would handle multiple monitors. It would put images on the screen. It would do stuff. But, it would do okay I, gaming, though. I think low end is like 200 to 300 now. Now, let me say this. Okay. Though. I play devil's advocate. I had a 7970 gigahertz. That thing you know, was 400 to 600 if if I got lucky. And I can say that this RTX 3050 right here has a nicer cooler than my high-end 7970 had. Do I think this should cost more than 200? No. Is that more than 100? Yes. But the cooler is better than my old high-end card, which you remember the high-end cards, they looked ridiculous back then. Yeah, but when when NVIDIA launched... did they bring out the Founders Edition with the 1080? I think they did. 1080 rather than 2080. <clears throat> you um, could argue they, they did brought, with Kepler, but it was it was Pascal is when it really took off. I but think. when they brought out the Founders Edition initially, because we all just thought that meant reference design, and then we realized mm-hmm. it didn't mean reference design. It actually meant bloody good piece of hardware that was really good and was cheaper than the add-in board alternatives, which was just like too bizarre for words. So anybody with half an ounce of common sense, in my view, bought the uh, Founders Edition. And then NVIDIA seemed to kind of twig this as well. And it's like, well, hang on a minute. We can get all that sweet margin for ourselves, and we can now make the Founders Edition a premium product, which is what they then did. I, I just think Jensen just, if he, he, the, the man cannot walk past an opportunity. I, I just think it's just that. And I think now he's going to look at this product stack and go, I've got, every, I've got a price point goes from this to that. Pick one. What can you afford by that? He was doing this, um, did, did you see the keynote from CES when he was doing that slightly mad karaoke thing? Um, so he Sounds did, they had some, it was an AI thing where essentially yeah. it was, uh, uh, we all love NVIDIA. But uh, bear in mind that keynote at CES, I was saying CES, I meant Computex, Computex. Um, there were 3,000 people in that room. It was a new hall at the Nangang Hall 2, albeit about 1,000 of them were NVIDIA partner employees. So they were, you know, they, they were the, the cheer chorus. Um, but you had a lot of people singing, we all love NVIDIA. And Jensen stand there saying, and it was some weird line, it was, uh, I, come to, I come to Taiwan all the time and I buy things from you guys. I buy things. But now for once I can come along and, and you're buying from me. It's like Taiwan's been buying from NVIDIA for years. What are you talking about? But And then he came up with this mantra, which was, 
And I can say, the more you buy, the cheaper it gets. And the more you buy, the cheaper. And, and the, the thing more is, you buy, the more you save. Very famous, yeah. The more GPUs you buy, the more money you save. Right. And it was just like, what are you on? And then I looked at it and go, yeah, trillion dollar market cap. So it doesn't matter. It, the man makes the weather. It doesn't matter what he says. It becomes true. I truly think that is his his position now, and that's the position of NVIDIA. And with GPUs, they've got a product stack that goes from, you know, two and a half grand with an AIO cooler, which is daftly expensive, but call it 2000 for a good 4090, all the way down to whatever. Um, how much money have you got? Buy that. Let's see, but the thing is with the 48, I just sent you a leak, uh, uh, not a leak, a link if you would want to look at it. The 4080... I have AIB is telling me this is the worst selling high end card in their history. Oh, sure. Like, yeah, it's terrible. this is it's terrible. So, I agree that there's no way they're going to like some, and I see people in the comments say this well, the 4080 needs to be $700. Never going to happen. So, get over no. that, first of all. But I do think a thousand's possible. Uh, maybe you don't. I'm wondering if you think it would make any difference unless it was at least a thousand, because I, I don't, don't think, think it I, will. I don't, I don't, so, at. Computex, some people I were talking to from the YouTube tech community um, had a meeting with NVIDIA to discuss how they might review products. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, and apparently uh, NVIDIA made no progress with them whatsoever in attempting to get their message across. Mm -hmm. um, and That's they, interesting. They, and then they... And they, they, they uh, the, the, there were many attempts made, and it was just no up against a brick wall time and again, and quite rightly so. Um, and uh, it quite clearly came down to the guy from Nvidia who was attempting to have this rather one-sided conversation. Clearly, was in a position where. Every one of our products is amazing and wonderful and the best mm -hmm. in class, no matter what you think. And quite clearly, there must be no room for the competition to breathe, which would include both AMD and Intel. And never mind the facts. Mm -hmm. uh, and th that's it. Uh, and I, I, all the rest is just, is just static. I don't think Jensen, in a world where his... Um, is uh, A100s and H100s are 20,000 bucks a piece, and he's making 10 billion in a quarter. I, I, he's not, he's I, I'm not curious listening. what you think about this, though, because I'm hearing the AI market is softening faster than people are expecting, at least behind the scenes. Like a few months ago, what I was told is if you want an H100, you need to buy an HP server, throw the yes. server away, and take the H100. And then I heard, well, you can get one for 30 to 40 grand, but it's going to be like a 12 month lead time. And then it became a six month lead time. And already I'm told there's down to a few months and there might not be lead time soon. So I think a lot of this demand for H 100s was everybody got hyped up, placed as many orders as they could. And now they're all canceling half of them because they realize they don't need more it. Now that's not to say that this is going to sell badly, but if AI sales were starting to soften, don't you think NVIDIA might be looking at this and going, oh, we better have a backup plan next year. We can't completely alienate gamers. Oh, um, ah. especially with the China thing going on. It's like, ooh, we might have yeah, to do but this. Not, not in terms of not in terms of the price they're charging for a gaming GPU. I don't mm -hmm. think in that sense. I think more in the sense of fire the guy who who loses to AMD. I think in th that will be a thing. And so God knows A square that circle. It must be a horrendous position to be in. But mm. the AI softening thing, the argument that was made was if the nominally $20,000 thing with a 70% margin and look, we're a $1 trillion market cap company. In other words, every single message screams NVIDIA's making bank on this. And then they're suddenly going, yeah, what do you want to do about it? Um, it, it clearly opens a way for somebody else to say, well, hang on a minute, we've got this other thing. Sure, it doesn't mm -hmm. use CUDA, but you, you, yeah, if you're 20,000 card GPU and you need a great many of them, but after all, NVIDIA um, has been investing in AI startups, hasn't it? Mm. Um, 
I mean, everyone and, is right now, to be fair. Sure. But but NVIDIA, I believe their investment takes the form of GPUs. Mm-hmm. <laughs> They're saying, here is delivery oh, and they've of They've always been smart about that. They'll send their developer Absolutely. tips to universities and get everyone used to using it early. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, that has seeding products, and Jensen would sign a server with the Jensen. No, I, I take that point in time. No, what I mean is, in order to get a share of a given company, it's like instead of saying, here's my check for a certain number of dollars for a percent of your company, it's like... Oh, so you think they'd start doing that more if that was an issue? Right. Uh, so it's just like, you know, the graphics cards are literally money. Uh, and it's just like, huh. So no, that's 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 an untenable situation. Um, it, you know... If nothing else, uh, no, I, I think I think it's remarkable. But just as the crypto thing, no one talks about it, it's gone. The AI thing, clearly AI will be here. How AI is done, don't know. I mean, it's been it's been the case for many years that um, if you've ever been in one of those uh, demo cars that um, they, they drive around that teach you know AI or they're training the thing in the streets of Vegas or somewhere, and it's I mean you're you're an automotive guy, aren't you? Um, and they're packed with compute power. Um, mm. And that's the training phase. And then when it comes out, it's got some little box under the seat and it's got a whole bunch of LiDAR and radar and God knows what and cameras. And the training phase, NVIDIA's had that tied up for years. And then Tesla switched away from NVIDIA, didn't they? They went to their own silicon and such mm. like. Um, yeah, a lot of it, people it, are, yeah. Right. But that's that's long been the way. Um, you know, you try buying a tablet that ran on NVIDIA other than their own, other than their own shield. I can't think of one. Um, you know, they had design win, design win, design win. Where's the product? So the AI thing, no, I, I think NVIDIA is making money. But the fact they've got into networking and the um, control chips for, for the network clusters and even... Uh, the chassis for the servers, they're having NVIDIA branded chassis, which they showed at Computex. Uh, it's, the, the, the man is a rolling ball of energy who continually moves. He doesn't sit still. He has that market. He makes a fortune. He keeps it going whilst moving on. The question for me is what's next? Mm. It's because I, I didn't see this coming. I didn't see crypto coming. So whatever comes next, I don't see that coming. Yeah, it's like it'd be fun to sit here and speculate, but there's a reason he's seen it first. Is it's his entire job, and he's a genius. At it. So yeah. like, you know, it's hard. Yeah, it's hard to say what the next thing would be. But my suspicion is he's going to have to find it actually within a couple of years because I do think we're going to see an AI. It's not going away. It's just the dot com bubble. You know, the internet didn't go away, but pets dot com did, and unfortunately. Uh, fortunately for some companies that I think were stupid, unfortunately for some companies that I think went through hard times that really didn't deserve to go through hard times. Um, I think we we might actually see that, though, in the next two years. It'll be interesting to snag, see what he goes with next. Is the snag from my point of view is that um, NVIDIA has driven the price of graphics cards up, mm-hmm. and AMD has followed because that's where the margin is. And Intel... And we we have all in the uh, tech community hoped and prayed that Intel graphics would be a success because poor Intel. Well, we should have prayed more. <laughs> right, we've all said it, and we we all know the, the the fallacy, and we all know these companies if they get half a chance to put their boot back on our neck, they'll do it. We all know all this stuff, and we know where we're at. The thing to me that has changed, I said this to Gordon Ung at um. And Gordon, if you're watching this, love you, um, is the thing for me that's changed is you can now buy consoles. So you can buy a PS5 or an Xbox mm. Series X for £450 here in the UK, and you can buy the digital versions for 250 or 300 Now, right now, an ATX3 power supply costs you yeah. Yeah, 250 or whatever it might be. Um, and the idea that someone's laying out money for a 4090 and with the first wave of the 12 volt high power connector and potentially the thing melts because you have to plug the cable in just so, or whatever it might be, that's just intolerable. That's, that's just crazy nonsense. Um, I, I have a horrible dread that having driven the graphics prices so high that 
Jensen's going to move on to whatever the next thing is <laughs> and essentially leave everyone hanging. And you're suddenly going to go, why are we paying four grand for a gaming PC when I can get a console and the most wonderful OLED TV and a couch <laughs> and <beer. laughs> the combined price, yeah. You know, because the thing is, in 2000, 2001, you couldn't get the consoles. And going back to your question from your guy about um, Risk Five on consoles, to me, any platform, it's the games. Mm. So you've got Microsoft and Sony and libraries and Steam. If uh, And we, NVIDIA tried the game streaming. I mean, how's that going? Google tried game streaming. How's that gone? You know, well, the, the, and I talked to uh, Wendell about that too, and he argued hmm. that you're already seeing a de-cloudinization of, and you've touched on it, like doing more yeah. things locally. Yeah. And I think we're all realizing we don't need to do half of this crap in the crowd, the cloud. Like we don't need Absolutely to. Absolutely true. It's silly. And we're, I, I, my personal opinion has always been most gaming will be local. It will be forever yes. because there's always a cheaper box for 300 bucks that can play the same game better than you can stream it. So at a minimum, though, can we agree that if they were to make, yeah, I mean, because, and I, and I mostly agree with you, they're going to do the minimum they think they need to, to keep the oh, ball geez. rolling. Oh, but if they were to make that big of a difference with the 4080, what would that tell you? Oh, the Jensen is in hospital for a month and somebody had the authority to make a decision behind his back. Um, I, oh, come I, on. You don't think it would indicate something else, though, besides... Yeah, yeah it, it would, it would. But I, I I, think the level of ego involved, because it would be... I, I think it would be like a... This company killed EVGA. Good God, you know, I mean, who saw that one coming? Uh, it, it's just remarkable. Uh, absolutely remarkable. Here you've got what we regarded as the, as the Skunk Works flagship I know. Uh, yeah. brand. And it's just like, and it's an, uh, no, I, I truly think that's the level. That's the level we're at. It's like any margin that's being taken by a partner company is wasted margin. Mm -hmm. Now that is truly how it seems to be. It is a brutal <laughs> that's thing. Certainly, to say. how they treat them. Yeah. Yes, it, it's absolutely that. It's like you fools just waste it. I mean. I, I'm I'm almost saddened that they didn't just stick with um, Founders Edition. Mm -hmm. Call it the Jensen Edition, you know. Just, let's just let's just you know just do it and, and stick with that. Um, and to hell with the partners. I'm, I'm I'm slightly surprised they didn't do that. It felt like they were going that way. I think it's kind of a slow moving coup, is what they're doing, mm. where they're like, hey, if you can play ball, then you get to be part of the party still. If you can't, mm. we we don't care. You know, yeah. I do no, no, think no, no. that's I'm, basically their plan. Quite right. Uh, and I, I, it's, um, and, and therefore, console. Mm -hmm. it, it really is just that. It's, it's quite bizarre. Um, and yet there's still huge amounts of money in gaming. I mean, who is it suggesting that um, somebody might buy Steam and then just like? <laughs> I don't think they're <laughs> the going to. That would be like, Phil Spencer, the guy who wants to buy everything. Yeah, that's uh, it. That's you want it. to buy but Nintendo we, too and Steam, yeah. even though it's part of a private company. But yeah, well, they're a private company, therefore they don't report. But we know they make fortunes, absolute mm -hmm. fortunes. Therefore, in what world are they going to change that? No, thank you. We'll stick with this. Therefore, thank God, it means that PC gaming continues to be a thing. Um, How old's Gal uh, Gavin? Or uh, I mean, who, who's the uh, 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 Gabe? I'm forgetting. Like my brain. Gabe Newell. <laughs> if I were to guess, Bill Spencer is waiting for him to go away and then going to try to buy it. That'd be my guess. Oh, could, could, could well be. The I case. talked to someone behind the scenes about this. I'm like, the only way that happens. Someone said to me, they said over Gabe Newell's dead body, and I'm like, eh, <laughs> I'm talking about a spry twenty year old. So maybe it is over that. Well, it's, it's a succession. I'm plan, just letting everybody it? know that's how they would do it if they wanted to, in my opinion. Well, quite. And then that's the other thing is that Jensen is, Jensen is, I think, 60 as well. Um, and he's been, he's in video now 30 years old. And Jensen, I mean, he's as fit as a butcher's dog, that guy. Um, mm -hmm. and, Very big difference, yes, between Gabe yes. Newell and Jensen yes. Wegg, if you look at them, but, yes. But, but in, <laughs> no in offense words, to you, Gabe. I do love you, Gabe. But. 
I, I, I don't I don't see Jensen going anywhere anytime until no. such time as he chooses to, and I don't think that's going to be for a very long time. So um, I think geopolitics is going to move before Jensen does. But um, yeah, so um, no, forty eighty. I, I have no no confidence in things moving in the direction that benefits PC gamers whatsoever. I, do, I just don't. I just wish to God at the moment that games that were coming out worked better instead of being you know god awful pieces of crap um yeah I mean, what's the what's the current one alan wake 2 or whatever it, it's like, what, what are you doing you're selling us games at 50 60 70 dollars a piece and you're putting it on serious hardware uh, and we're getting jokes like um goes back to the you know, does your pc play crisis you know it's a test of your computer whether it can play the current game because the current game is so poorly to play optimized. devil's advocate I do think people should go look at the 2080 Ti reviews and see that it was getting like 50 frames in 4K and it was $1,300. Very true. Very true. But that's but that's back in the day when 4K was a particularly uphill struggle. Um, and now, now we've got uh, all these uh, technologies that insert false frames. Um, did you see that today... Yeah, I don't like yes- those. <laughs> yes. Um, today or yesterday, Cortex put up one of his uh, great new thing on the Horizon videos, albeit I think the Horizon's a very long way away, but in essence it's uh, games generated by AI, therefore don't even technically need a graphics card. I was looking at it going, no. don't quite see how that's going to be a thing anytime soon, and believe it when I see it, that really was show me the money. Um, I'll believe but, it but, when it runs on a co-processor, that's what I'll say. <laughs> Yes, precisely, uh, and 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 doesn't require the cloud or and has zero latency. But um, but it was like the point being is I suppose like a black swan event. Conceivably, that's something that pops up and suddenly means you don't need a graphics card that can handle five hundred watts of cooling or whatever. Perhaps there's some magic little dongle that will suddenly do it. But my my confidence in that is low. It my my personal right. opinion is it's not that hard actually to run games at reasonable settings. Like I just got my girlfriend, uh, I got it from Minis Forum. It's a 6600 M, which really is just a 6600. It's the same specs mm. as the desktop one. Mm. Um, and remember the desktop one almost uses the amount of energy as a laptop chip anyways. Um, okay. And it was running Hogwarts in 1600 P at 60 frames ultra. And I'm like, we're complaining about graphics cards. Well, Look, I'll if you, that. And that's, you know, a card you can get right now on desktop for 200 bucks. I just go, you know, at the end of the day, I think we've got to remember what hard to run graphics looked like. Like Crisis was hard to run at 60 at a low resolution with Ultra. It looked great for the time, but turn on DLSS or, you know, even FSR above 1440p looks decent and a low end cards running a game. Everyone complained about at ultra and the hardware and box analysis I saw of Alan wake two was it's incredibly hard to run. You need recent yeah. hardware, but to be fair, my memory, I'm sorry if I'm mischaracterizing this, everybody, Tim seemed very impressed by the graphics and that is kind of a walking simulator where you shoot sometimes to yeah. my, well, the first one was, I don't, I don't know if this one's more action oriented. <laughs> um, you know, but, like, you know, the first Alan Wake was less of an action game than Control, really. It was much mm. slower paced. Um, but so, I don't know. I, I'm actually more of an optimist in this regard. Um, and my biggest problem with generated frames is, yeah, I don't know, go from DLSS quality to balanced or turn down two settings and you'll be doubling your frame rate mm. anyways. Um, I don't know. I, I, I'm much more optimistic about it. I just think that we've become a bit obsessed with maxing out settings because it was so easy to during the PS4 gen, because those consoles were underpowered. And now consoles aren't underpowered. And if you think about it, I don't know what the Series X or PlayStation runs Alan Wake 2 at, but, you know, let's take a given console game and say it's running at, I don't know, usually it's like 1440p dynamic Mm. 60. Right, so if this console was running things at 1440p 60, then to do 4K 120, you need three to five times the performance and you need a CPU that's two to three times stronger than Zen two. So like at a certain point I do have to argue like, yeah, well the consoles aren't weak and they're running this. If they're running this at 30 frames, you're going to need something four times stronger to run it at 120, or you're going to have to turn down a couple settings. But the good news is 
if you turn down settings now, it doesn't look like complete ass like it did 10 years ago. My and God. And also, the, the current consoles, haven't they got a 400 watt power supply on them? Or slightly less? Oh, no. Yeah. Like they use 200 watts. I mean, 250 watts. Is power it as low as 200? I, I, thought the, I thought the full fat ones had, had more than that. But I mean, obviously, we know that consoles they can run the power supplies uh, they can run very close to the limits because obviously it's a completely known quantity they need very little in hand but the the very fact that you're talking that kind of level rather than you know our friend i9 14900k you know whacking up to 300 watts for the cpu yeah. and then the gpu doing the thing and i was running a um case review hasn't gone up yet uh, and i was running so i was running the i7 Fourteen seven hundred k just for a laugh, rather than the i nine, and that was sucking two seventy five watts, and I was running a forty eighty, which was pulling three two five, I think, and the system was running seven hundred watts at the wall socket, and you just go, you know, holy god, there you go. Compare that to a console, um, it's uh, it's weird. I love PC gaming, but but so sadly, so many of the answers to so many of the questions seem to be console. Um, hmm. because of primarily because of the cost. Um, and then the thing is that we know full well that there are monumentally high end PCs over in the, so uh, again, overclockers, I know you're familiar with overclockers, the, um, eight pack who's their in-house, um, overclocker, just as Deb Bauer is for case King in Germany has his range of, uh, eight pack PCs, which are crazy monumentally high ex high end expenses, like thirty thousand pounds kind of money, and he says essentially when they spec them, people will say, "What's the most you can put in it?" And he goes, "Well, I could do this," and they go, "We'll do it." Well, I could put two fifty six gigabytes of memory in, but it does nothing for you. Well, I want mm -hmm. that then, don't I? And and it's a handful of people, but it's in the dozens per year rather than one or two. And sadly, that's the other end of the PC gaming experience. It's, it's well, a think, very wide, very right. wide continuum. We have to accept a AMD and NVIDIA said they wanted graphics cards to do everything 10 years ago, and they've mm. achieved it. They did it. They do everything yes. now. But what that means is if they're not being used for AI, if they're not being used for crypto mining, if they're not being used to render videos... You know, I mean, I saw people in Vega came out on Reddit. There's this one guy that bought a bunch of Vega Frontier editions and it looked like a mining rig with the little ribbons coming off. He's like, yeah. I'm using this to render indie videos, like the special effects in indie videos uh, as a contractor. Like huh. these are teraflops of performance. And I think I'm actually optimistic things are going to go a little bit back more towards normal next year. But I don't think we're ever going back to 10 years ago. And there's good and some bad with that. Consoles only game, so they can be sold for less because they're only going to be used for that. Now, hmm. for now, we'll see. Uh, and then graphics cards can be used for gaming and non-gaming. So there's always going to be this 30% premium, I think, to 50% over the console because you use it for more than just gaming. The good news is, is that if you turn down a few settings, it doesn't look like a horror show compared to before. And it's like... Yeah, so I don't know. If you want a game on PC, get a 6600, and it won't be as strong as a PS5. But turn down a few settings, eh, it'll look close. And, you know, I mean, if you want a game at 120 hertz, you can if you want to. On PS5, it's at the whim of the developer deciding if they want to add that option or not. So that is where I think the arguments for why you want a gaming PC are still there. They're just different arguments from 10 years ago. It sounds like your argument just drove a stake through any variant on the 4080. It's just like, nail that down, because it's just because uh, you, you're going significantly down market from that. In other words, th that's not tinkering with the price of a variant of 4080. That's just like, ah. Well, the 7900 is. XTX has actually outsold it by like a huge margin, which is quite an achievement for AMD. Oh. And my understanding is the 7800 XT is still kind of hard to keep in stock in a lot of locations. So I think NVIDIA is going to do what they think they have to do. And I think the most they'll do is a thousand dollar card that's better. Now, my question is, is if they charge a thousand dollars, does AMD just drop their price to 900 and 700 and then no one cares? Because I think and maybe this would be a good thing to close on to round all the way back to hours ago when you said this. You know, you said you think AMD almost helped Intel get off their high horse and charge prices that made them move product. 
The 4070 started selling, I was told recently, pretty well when it dropped to four fi- uh, to 550, which if you go on Newegg, it is 550 now. They won't admit they dropped the price, but my partners told yeah. me we're paying less for it. Um, or NVIDIA's partners told me they're paying less for it. And it's almost like at a certain point, you feel like AMD or somebody has to go to NVIDIA, cause competition, and then when they respond, they sell better. It's the same with the Turing Super Series. Turing sold terrible. They release super, it sells better. You go, it's almost like some of these companies can't help themselves. If they just be 10% less greedy, they'd make even more money. And I think then the question, though, becomes, does AMD realize that with Zen 5? So that's why trying to tie it all together, but it's like... I get the logic. What what was that awful expression that was used by the picture of the guy's face, the AMD guy, the the debating term? (laughs) Uh, Scott Herkelman, yeah. Thank you. Um, And uh, and that thing of, essentially, (sighs) that was our strategy all along. It's like, no, it wasn't. I don't think it was. Of course I've had it NVIDIA I mean, people bring that up and say that wasn't their strategy. Of course it wasn't. Way. I mean, it was obvious it wasn't. It's just like, well, well, then, then that's a stupid. St- what is this nonsense you're speaking? It is just total bullshit. Um, so the the fact that these people can do this stuff is like, ha. Huh. And I've been suckered more than once on a launch review, and we're told the price is this, whatever. Oh, yeah. It doesn't matter what the product is, and then it turns out, um. Oh, that's only for the first batch. Oh, well, what happens in the yep. second batch then? Oh, price uh, d- and, and it's AMD's not even necessary to right. Will it go they up or will it, it go down? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's just like, oh, uh, Jesus wept. Um, so there's there's in that in that regard, nothing keeps them honest. Just nothing. Um, mm-hmm. the, the opportunist doesn't begin to describe it. Um, so I. I hope to goodness you're correct. I hope to goodness that NVIDIA goes... It could be 1,200. I don't know that it'll be 1,000. What, what you'd like good. to think is NVIDIA goes, we are making so much money all over the place that if we want to shift this warehouse of stuff that people currently hate, we can do this thing. And and the only question is whether they go, sure thing, let's do that thing. Wouldn't that be a gorgeous world? Wouldn't that be lovely? Um, I, I hope you're right. I, I hope your reader's right. Um, sadly, I've not seen many examples of that happening but i hope mm. this is true yeah anyway it's late yes <laughs> i was i was like i'm i know you've got to get to bed at some point here so i was trying <laughs> to find a good way <laughs> to like end it, and, <laughs> well, we've but, done it we've done it um, please John, plug John, yourself John, tell people where to find you um so kickguru.net on the web and kickguru tech on youtube Okay, and of course, you can find this if you're watching it now after three hours. You have probably know where to find this, but you know, remember to subscribe to Moore's Law is Dead, ring the bell button, uh, subscribe to Broken Silicon, your podcast app of choice, give us a review, join the Patreon uh, to ask us questions and all the other, and this comes out, of course, early and ad-free for patrons, and uh, Leo, thank you for coming on. I can't say I, I I enjoyed this a ton, and I hope you'll come back on someday in the future. This was, this well, was really good. It. Next time, we'll keep it more concise. Keep it down to the two hours. <laughs> no promises. We'll see. All right. <laughs> Thanks Cheers. very much, and good night all. This podcast was brought to you by the YouTube channel and website Moore's Law is Dead. Moore's Law is Dead and Broken Silicon are trademarks of their creator, Tom. That guy is me, and I am indeed the creator, editor, writer, and showrunner of Moore's Law is Dead podcast, videos, articles, and other media. However, it's not just me. Moore's Law is Dead is a team with Broken Silicon co-hosted by my brother Dan, audio editing by Gerard Cortez, renders being done by the industrial designer Jean-Philippe Clermont, and special assistance is also provided by Carmen Cry and Kerry Nosugad as well. Find all of our information at www.moreslawisdead.com on the about slash support page in the event you do want to hire me for consulting work, hire Gerard for audio work, hire Jean-Philippe for industrial design work, or you're interested in working with Carbon Cry or Kerry No Sugata as well. You can also find our long-term sponsors on that page if you want to show them some love for putting food on our tables. Or you can also mail us some love. You can send letters or hardware donations to the following address. Moore's Law is Dead, P.O. Box 60632 in Nashville, Tennessee, zip code 37206. Although, to be honest, the best way to show Moore's Law is Dead some love is to support us on Patreon. Patrons are what makes Moore's Law is Dead content truly 
possible. Every month and really every day, depending on who you're talking about, me, Gerard, Dan, and John Philippe are working tirelessly to provide a steady stream of content that we could not keep doing unless we knew the work was possible without being reliant on sponsors dictating every little thing we put out. Don't get us wrong. We love our sponsors, but we love directly working for you, our fans, much more. If you have any extra money, even a couple free dollars a month, consider supporting us directly on Patreon. Those couple of monthly dollars will get you access to the exclusive podcast Die Shrink, voting on subjects of future podcast episodes, the ability to ask guests questions, and of course, access to the Moore's Laws Dead Discord full of like-minded people who I am sure would love to meet you. I am one of them. Additionally, higher tiers get access to early, ad-free episodes of Broken Silicon, the ability to ask questions in all Broken Silicon episodes and loose ends live streams ahead of the recording, and the entire back catalog of Moore's Law is Dead podcasts, in addition to having thanks in the credits of videos and podcasts depending on the tier with other perks available as well. And hey... If you cannot afford to support us directly every month, please do share Moore's Law is Dead videos and podcasts with friends and family and on social media and websites like Reddit. And give Broken Silicon a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or your preferred podcast app of choice. All of this does really help us so much. But like I said, this podcast would not be possible without it. the patrons directly providing predictable and reliable support every month. And so now it is time to give a personal thanks to the greatest of the fans. The following supporters are at the 10 gigahertz or higher supported levels. Brad Medlin, Drita Foles, Z Chits, Daniel D, Christopher Ricks, Aaron Close, Jan Renner, Daniel High, GZ Ziggy, Brian Riggleman, MJB1, Sam Miller, Deke, SNES Chalmers, Jim Ferriera, Valcom Alev, Nicholas Buckner, Andrew S, Jensen Wang, Nathan Mose, Gregory Sacker, Sarcastro, Devin Dingle, Greg Wanchuk, Chris Rich, 3DS Play 08, Halbuma, Hardforum.com, Compressed Earth Blocks, Shredbird, Dr. Foreman, Gingerman Cannon, Jonathan, Blake, Franco Frederick, Jake223, Jake Martin, Holden Mobley, Zlicky, Christopher A. Butler, Sammy Malas, Stephen Hart, Meat and Pork, Tim Robb, Jordan Simkovic, Ian Clifford, Travis Gooding, Julian Leak, The Boss Haas, Nanny and Deepest Learners, Stephen, Mad, Zutu Taylor, Stephen Coates, Michael McGee, Greg, Patrick Crow, Emmy Will Chief, Tommy, Mark Mitchell, Roger Davies, I Should, Mark Rainmaker, Cameron, James Anderson, Cole Attic, Judson N. Cameron, Wesley Sager, Henry Zhang, Michelle Pell, D31337, Antics, Chrysantine, The Eternal Dreamers, Nathan Zink, Hexapuma, Reginald Ari, Teak Autumn, Jackson Miller, JSMMH, Colin Tadards, Gaiman Since Reagan, Jeff Sutler, Loop Hole 35, One Star, James I, Raider, Corey Leonard, Little Germany, Shay, Post Media, Dave Schultz, Melodic Warrior, Mac Daffy, Stephen Dick, Chuck Glidden, Brett Jones, Austin Haggerty, Justin Bustle, I 711700K, Joe Foot, Toka, Hardland, Slush Boss C2, Jamie Whitworth, Jansen Ingima, Joseph Kelly, Seb- David Sebastian, Samuel Park, Earth Taurus, Keith Moore, Hemsa Gung, Tails 2299, Neil Vale, Verga, John Sisyphos, Fenty CZ, The Forbidden Juice, Per Leakman, RB Racer, AC, Lord Starstream, Michael Cosey, Dr. J Mad, Alex Vega, Free D, Brian Wright, John Swin, Rodent BC, Win Wang, Jola Martina, Kikum, Elber Gunn, Solarized 80, Trevor Renfro, Yeti, Thalo215, Matthew Marlowe, Raisin Biscuit, and Jeff Johnson. And of course, thank you to Sahara for the music. <laughs>